Welcome to the short courses Thursday session, uh, TFOS 2022. Uh, uh, for as folks are joining, um, <clears throat> the material I'm going to go over is available online. So uh, I'll leave this up for a f another minute or so. Uh, if you want to, <clears throat> excuse me, um, access it, uh, just go to that website there. Scroll down to see the image that shows the CredGen Fluid Management, and uh, click on that. And it's a Google Doc that's shared. Uh, to anybody with a link and I keep that always available publicly. So uh, that's the material I'll be going through. <clears throat> uh, so let's get started. I'll move to this and go to full screen. I'm going to try and run this all from a, a browser uh, because there's a few links that I'm going to try and share and see how that works out. Um, uh, the other thing I'm kind of experimenting with here, I haven't done a short course before uh, using uh, um, without using slides. So um, I appreciate any feedback folks have as I go through this. Uh, I, I was hoping that uh, presenting it in this format makes it a little bit easier to go back uh, as a reference and, and, and look up uh, things as you've seen them uh, presented here. So um, we've got about three hours um, uh, and about six major topics to cover here. Uh, so I was thinking of trying to keep it to about a half hour for each major uh, subheading uh, and then maybe a, a 10 minute break after, uh, you know, at the top top of the hour, just to kind of give everybody a break. And in case I've made anybody fall asleep, you got a chance to wake back up. Uh, but we're going to start with um, uh, an introduction here. Um, and again, this is just passive techniques. I'm working now or trying to get working on the active uh, cryogenic fluid management uh, report similar to this. Uh, maybe if I've got enough bandwidth and motivation, I'll be able to uh, uh, present something at the next TFAS next year on that. Uh, but for the, for this time, it's just the um, passive, and I'll describe in a minute uh, what that what that encompasses. <clears throat> but I'm going to start with an introduction about uh, looking at it from a from a system standpoint, very quickly, top level mission and vehicle drivers, because uh, this is very important to uh, understand when you start looking at cryogenic fluid systems and and how to design them and. Uh, look at the operations and so forth. And then a little bit of discussion about thermophysical properties um, and then thermodynamic uh, basic behaviors, uh, fluid dynamics and heat transfer, particularly at reduced environments, because that's where we have a lot less data and a lot less correlations. And then <clears throat> finally, in all of these uh, uh, major chapters end with uh, introductory calculation, uh, I'm sorry, calculation examples. This one's for the introduction ones. Um, I think each of them have about three uh, in a normal uh, classroom setting and probably, you know, ha have folks do it and then we would talk about them afterwards, but uh, it's a little bit different here. So I, th I think it's probably going to end up being more about I'll just introduce them quickly and uh, folks can take a look at them off, uh, you know, uh, out of sync on online and, and uh, any feedback would be great on that. So let me get started with the introduction. And then as we get, uh, jump into these other sections, I'll describe what's in there as we go along. Uh, so just to, to set kind of expectations, the objective uh, of this report and therefore the short course here in the next uh, few hours uh, is, is really uh, order of magnitude uh, type calculations for quick system trades, uh, sort of um, defining the trade space, uh, figuring out what feasible designs might make sense or, or how they impact your overall vehicle uh, and, and, you know, in your mission segments. Um, they also are helpful for uh, kind of a sanity check when you start getting into higher fidelity models, which of course require more time and resources. So, uh, so it's kind of a twofold, I think, um, benefit uh, what I'm going to present here in terms of both uh, narrowing the field of what, what you want to uh, spend more resources on with higher fidelity modeling and then also providing maybe some sanity checks afterwards. Um, the, the equations I'm going to show can be automated with a variety of techniques. Um, I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail about that, but I've provided some uh, resources if you'd like to, to look into options there. Uh, most of the examples I show here are uh, using Excel and a few, very few cases, Visual Basic that's built into Excel. Uh, but there's lots of other options out there. And I, I have a couple of footnotes, as I mentioned, uh, that talk about uh, other uh, open source codes that are available. Uh, I've been using Python more recently, but uh, it's a limited group of folks, I think, that are familiar with Python. So I try to keep it more familiar. Most folks are familiar with Excel, so I think things will look familiar to them as they look at these examples. Uh, and then I, I promised a definition of what, <clears throat> what I'm, I'm covering here in terms of uh, this, this course. Um, 
if you if you break it down, and there's a lot of ways to break down cryogenic uh, uh, thermal design, but if you break it down as a passive, <clears throat> where your only power is valve actuation, but no other power involved, uh, and then active, where you actually have say active cryo refrigeration systems. Uh, pumps, mixers, that sort of thing. And then hybrid kind of falls in the middle there. And of course, all of these boundaries are sort of uh, uh, gray areas where, where there's crossover. But uh, I just as a way to kind of calibrate a little bit, uh, today's topics are going to be looking mostly from, from a design standpoint at structures, insulation, uh, penetrations, which are basically defined as any, any solid conduction path that uh, goes from some environmental temperature to your cryogen. So uh, uh, basically a heat flux or a heat leak uh, source. Uh, I'll use the term heat leak a lot. It's kind of a, a common in cryogenics. If you're not familiar with it, it's just referring to the heat flux. So um, if you hear that term. So uh, I'll talk about these, these sorts of topics and then a lot of operations that also get involved in here. And then uh, so there may be some passing mentions of some of these other topics, but they'll be delved into uh, more deeply in a follow on report to this. Uh, this is the uh, blog I mentioned talking about some different ways to automate if you're interested in that. And I also used to, uh, about 10 years, I uh, taught a course on uh, Visual Basic in Excel on how to use it for engineering uh, analysis uh, that's available from this uh, link here. <clears throat> and taught it at uh, ATI and a, a number of companies over the years. Uh, so if, if you are interested in using Excel, that might be helpful to you. Uh, and again, the blog has uh, in the top link there, uh, or footnote number one has some other options if you want to consider that. So jumping now into the uh, mission of vehicle drivers, and I, I won't go into detail here. I try to present this more in this one page format, sort of as a, as a, uh, I guess uh, a mental way to checklist or, or a way to think through some of this uh, top level system information because you know there's a tendency and I'm certainly guilty of this too uh, as we get into a new project to just drill down and, and do the function that we've been asked to do uh, and yet if you don't have an understanding of some of these uh, top level mission uh, needs goals and objectives uh, how does that flow down into the requirements uh, what's the mission concept uh, so on and so forth um, it becomes, um, I wouldn't say difficult necessarily, but you, you're, you're less likely to come up with the best uh, solution if you don't have some understanding of these. And you may not have them all, but to the extent that you can define them or ask enough questions of the folks that do have the answers to that, I think it helps a great deal when you're, when you're designing the cryogenic fluid management system. Um, the, the other thing that's very important is to understand uh, what the concept of operation is for the overall mission. <clears throat> And I'm going to show a figure of this before I jump into some of these, uh, this example con ops here. Um, and uh, apologize, one of the, uh, I guess, uh, drawbacks of doing it in this mode is there's going to be a little bit of scrolling. I apologize for that. But uh, this is actually a, a design reference mission from uh, Constellation era, or certain, actually shortly before the Constellation era where their study was done. Uh, but I think it kind of is it, in a public domain. And by the way, um, one of the objectives I had with this report and of course is to only have public domain information in here. There's a lot of <clears throat> information that's confidential <clears throat> or ITAR or, or various other categories that you can't uh, uh, freely share. So uh, this report and everything I'm showing today is completely open, open, uh, public, publicly available and uh, all the footnotes are publicly available. So uh, this is an example of that as well. Um, this is a design reference uh, mission if you haven't looked at it before. It basically starts with a, a launch from the Earth. Um, for this particular, uh, uh, these were constellation um, type of uh, components and architecture, but there's a lot of similarity to what's happening now, if, if you're familiar, if you're, if you're involved in that. Um, you have a launch to a uh, low Earth orbit, and then this was an Earth departure stage. It's expended after a translunar injection, and then low lunar orbit, and, and then descent. Now, because this was a cargo mission, there is, uh, isn't the rest of the uh, concept of operation here, which would be, of course, an ascent from the moon and then uh, whatever architecture takes you back to uh, Earth reentry. But keeping that picture in mind, uh, now I'd like to go back and take a look at, at the con ops that I mentioned here. If you're looking at it now with your cryogenic fluid management hat on, you've got to really think about what's happening to your, your, your cryo propellant during each of those phases. 
because the solution in any one phase is not necessarily going to be the best solution in all of them. So, uh, and I'll get into more detail on this in, in, when we start talking about environments, but uh, think about what's happening on the pad. You've got propellant, propellant loading. Uh, you may have an abort scenario. You've got to uh, make sure you can handle and push the fluid back. Um, it, when you do an ascent, now you've got a, a different environment. You've got a, a ascent heating. Um, you've got uh, higher gravity levels. And then when the uh, engine cutoff hits, you have a sudden from uh, high G levels down to uh, very low G levels. So all of these things, and I won't step through all of these, but uh, the point is uh, understanding what that con ops is, is, is very important to, um, to start to uh, think about how you want your cryogenic fluid system to work. Uh, what it's going to have to uh, uh, see and, and be able to handle in terms of the environment and so forth. And then finally, uh, you know, as you start to flow down now from those top level system requirements and your con ops, you start to get into more of the propulsion system level. And of course, this is important to us. Uh, again, this course, although it could be applied to um, uh, other cryogenic fluids uh, on a spacecraft, uh, for instance, um, life support, uh, it's, it's today's discussion is going to be primarily focused on the propulsion system. So uh, as many of these questions, and again, these may not be uh, uh, the kinds of information you have on hand. You may have to ask questions of folks. But again, the more you understand about what the propulsion system is and what the requirements are, um, uh, the more uh, robust of a CFM system you can put in place. So there's a few uh, uh, notes on that. Again, this is just a one pager that I think if you're starting into a new cryogenic fluid management project or, or liquid propulsion system, it's just nice to walk through and, and see if you can uh, fill in as many, many of the blanks as possible. And a few footnotes, uh, this is kind of the gold standard for um, uh, uh, systems analysis and mission design for, for spacecraft. Um, and of course the handbook uh, uh, NASA has. Um, so let's move down. Um, Finally, uh, you know, we get into the primary function of the CFM system if you start to from that system level. And these are the kinds of things you tend to think about uh, with those systems. What, what are the tank pressures you're expecting to see? What's the maximum allowable? Because that's, of course, where you're going to have to vent the tank or do, do some other mitigation of uh, not reaching that maximum temperature. Uh, what are the uh, engine start and run boxes uh, that you're feeding uh, with this propellant? Um, and that, of course, is going to drive what conditions that propellant has to be in. Um, also, as you walk through your mission segments, what are the um, uh, fill levels or masses that, that are required at those different mission segments in order to complete the, the remainder of the mission? Uh, and what are the temperature and pressure storage conditions in each of those segments? And then finally, depending on, on what your uh, concept of operation is, you may have to do some thermal conditioning of those propellants. Uh, for example, if, if there's a, um, a risk that they're going to get outside of that start box or run box for your, for your engine feed. So uh, this could be uh, anything from a passive standpoint, uh, venting, for example, or uh, inactive that you could have some type of a refrigeration system that does that, cryo refrigeration. Um, so this is a, a little bit of a schematic from a, from a classic. I'll show you in a minute the reference. But <clears throat> Uh, I thought, you know, again, kind of looking from a systems level down, uh, this is a little bit dated, but it still has a lot of the key features that you're going to see in, in a liquid propulsion system. Uh, you've got some type of pressurization source. This is the fuel tank as shown here. An oxidizer tank is actually within the fuel tank. This is a common bulkhead, um, if you've heard that term before. Um, very common in, in upper stages to launch vehicle design. Um, pressure bottles can actually be within uh, the um, uh, fuel containment as they're shown here. And then uh, this is a fluid system schematic. So it gives you an idea of how, what the connections are, how the feed lines are connected schematically to the engines. And then, um, you know, this uh, falls into a, out to a design. Um, I think I can show the reference, yeah. So this is out of uh, design liquid propellant engines. Um, uh, 71. I have a, a later version, I think in the 90s, they did an update to this, uh, one of the other uh, uh, footnotes I have in here. But that's a, a fantastic reference just to kind of get a, a basic understanding from the time frame and the folks that actually developed some of these uh, initial um, uh, upper stages and in, in, in launch vehicles and, and how they're done. So this is an example of how that fluid schematic shown above turns into an, a preliminary design. 
<clears throat> and you can see there's uh, more information here in terms of the pressures that they're stored at, uh, uh, what kind of insulation perhaps is around. Uh, these are, I think, internal insulation. I don't think it's uh, called, the, oh yeah, tank internal insulation here. Um, one interesting thing, if you look back at some of these old ones, you, you actually see uh, things like liquid fluorine, which is a fantastic oxidizer and also really nasty stuff. So most, uh, most modern uh, systems are liquid oxygen, which is why all of the calculation examples I'm going to show uh, here uh, are using oxygen because it's such a common uh, cryogenic propellant uh, that, that you're probably going to be dealing with it in any liquid hydrogen, or, I'm sorry, liquid uh, propulsion system. Uh, another um, very uh, good resource to keep in mind, uh, the uh, S4B flight test that was done uh, on coast uh, is uh, the only publicly available uh, set of data that I'm aware of for cryogenic fluid management on orbit. Um, there's been other uh, work that's been done and some of it has been published uh, in public papers, um, Centaur Tank in particular. Um, but uh, nothing quite as extensive that I'm aware of uh, as this particular test. Uh, it was done in the 60s, um, a little bit of information about uh, the vehicle itself. Um, and I'm going to uh, pull on this information more as, as I go through uh, some of the rest of this uh, uh, course, uh, because it's helpful to, to look at it. Again, it's in the public domain. So, so you've got a baseline um, uh, to, to, to look at and, and begin to um, uh, set fundamentals of uh, whatever system you're starting to develop. Um, so a few interesting points. Uh, this Again, this was the third stage of the Saturn V, um, and um, it had internal insulation, uh, uh, which is actually being looked at, and in, in, I'll show some examples of that later on uh, by the Europeans. Um, uh, this was a liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen, a common bulkhead here, the oxygen tank down here, the hydrogen tank up here. Uh, this did had cold did have cold helium pressurization pressurization uh, high pressure tanks within the liquid hydrogen to keep it cold uh, one engine at the bottom um, again some some more general information um, so uh, we'll be pulling on that uh, i don't know if i let's see if i can show this uh, without causing us too much trouble uh, this is actually a video uh, from that flight test Let's see if it jumps to that without any problem. Oh, good. Uh, so if you haven't seen liquid hydrogen, uh, here's what liquid hydrogen looks like. Um, I, the only unfortunate thing with this video that's on YouTube is there, there's not a lot of information about what's actually going on, but uh, this is the video camera that was put on the flight. It's looking down into the hydrogen tank and the hydrogen's at a fairly high level here. And then, you know, it's going through the various mission operations. I think there's a few places where they might tell you what's happening. It's a little more quiescent. I think you see, you're seeing draining here going on during engine feed. Uh, and there's some very interesting uh, video here and you can look at it later. Oh, here's the third third orbital pass. So this is a third orbit in, in Leo. And you can see the, um, you know, the difference, of course, as you get into a very low acceleration uh, environment, you've got floating globules of uh, liquid and vapor and so forth uh, uh, going on inside of the tank. So. Uh, kind of a neat uh, video that now is uh, on YouTube, easily accessible. Try to get back out of this now. Uh, I might let, let you explore those links on your own. Uh, <laughs> okay, so uh, that's a video, uh, Saturn 4B again, uh, some general information. So um, let me jump into uh, thermal physical properties, uh, which is uh, going to be very important for, for uh, any of these systems in terms of analysis or design. Uh, there's a few options out there. Um, and again, uh, I'm sure folks on the line here are familiar with many of these, but <clears throat> just to kind of go over them so that you're aware, uh, there is a, a full screen again so you can see the little videos here. Uh, NASC has a chemistry web book online. I have a footnote here with a link to it. And again, this entire report is available online, so you can hit the link and uh, get get to that. Um, uh, it uh, has uh, most of the capability of their desktop program, not everything, but, but it, it's very helpful, especially if you're doing, um, you know, basic calculation, hand calculations, you're not trying to do very large uh, set of um, uh, system calculations. Uh, if you are going to have to do uh, quite a few, you might want to look into getting their RefProp uh, desktop uh, program. Uh, there's a 
what I think what they used to call nominal license fee at fee. I think it keeps going up <laughs> every time I look at it, but uh, it's not it's still uh, relatively inexpensive compared to many other software programs. But uh, with the ref prop, you <clears throat> do have a, a dynamic link library if you're working on the Windows system, which lets you integrate and, and call the uh, ref prop from things like Excel or uh, I think it will work with MATLAB, uh, MATLAB and other uh, other software platforms as well. Uh, of course, the drawback, or not sorry, drawback, but one of the things you have to keep in mind if you're using RefProp, um, you anyone who you share your um, spreadsheets, let's say, with or other calculations, has to have that license and have it on their computer in order to be able to use it. So <clears throat> that sometimes causes problems. Uh, you know, you get broken uh, broken data links and so forth if if folks don't have it, or if you're working on a different uh, uh, computer that doesn't have that license. Uh, I've been using more recently uh, an open source uh, code called CoolProp, and uh, I'll, I'll give one caution on this. Make sure you check with your IT organization wherever, you, wherever you're, if you're going to use this on a, on a laptop that's uh, owned by your organization to see what their um, policy is on open source in general and, and on CoolProp in particular uh, before you download it. <clears throat> Uh, I use it on, on my business laptop <clears throat> so that, um, you know, I, I guess I'm the IT department, so I take the risk. Uh, but it works uh, uh, great. I found it uses the same formulation that RefProp does and has been validated. They have documentation validating uh, the results to RefProp. Uh, so one of the advantages is they have a Windows installer, but it, it's also because it's open source, uh, uh, there's a lot of ways to access it. They have a Python module if you work in Python. so. Uh, it, it's very helpful from that standpoint. And again, because it is open source, uh, if you do share it, uh, other folks can can get their hands on it and, and use it. So uh, there's a, a few different ways of getting those thermal physical properties. Uh, in terms of thermodynamic behavior, uh, let me just do a quick time check, see how we're doing. Okay. Um, uh, I'm gonna show, uh, there's some text here you can read on your own about you know different ways to think about uh, what what happens within a cryogenic tank. Um, by the way, these are the links. Uh, this top link is the one to the uh, NIST online um, uh, uh, website available that you can you can get the uh, thermal physical properties online easily without having to get a license. So I just wanted to point that out, and then a few other uh, links as well. Uh, so it's probably easier to talk to this plot. Uh, in terms of the uh, basics about thermodynamics here. So uh, this has the three primary uh, liquid repellents that, that, that you'll probably be seeing or, or we're already working with, uh, methane, oxygen, and uh, pair hydrogen is the uh, spin state uh, for hydrogen at cryogenic temperatures. So um, be careful if, if you're looking at properties that you're working, working with the right uh, ortho uh, hydrogen, uh, is the spin state uh, or a majority of the spin state uh, for room temperature. So um, if you're looking at um, uh, gaseous stored hydrogen, uh, it's going to be what's called normal hydrogen, which is mostly ortho. Um, and again, this is all available in the various uh, uh, properties uh, um, uh, uh, software that I showed or a website. Uh, but if you're working in a cryogenic temperature and all the liquid hydrogen uh, that's de delivered, for, in, for instance, um, uh, the Kennedy for launch or any of the research facilities for testing, uh, has already been catalyzed into parahydrogen form. Uh, if it isn't, it, it, st it slowly uh, converts to that and it's a uh, exothermic reaction that's on the order of the latent heat of vaporization. So um, nobody wants that to happen. So it's always uh, delivered in parahydrogen form. Um, so enough uh, about parahydrogen. Uh, triple point is where uh, the condition where all three phases can exist, uh, solve liquid and vapor. Uh, getting down to triple point is how you produce, for example, in the case of hydrogen, slush hydrogen, it starts to form uh, solids on the surface. Uh, if you drop it down, I think it's about one PSI absolute. Uh, and, and it gets to that temperature. A uh, normal boiling point is the temperature for each of these fluids at one uh, standard atmosphere that is saturated. And then a uh, critical point, which is outside of this range, I'm only going from triple point for each of these fluids up to 10 bar in pressure. Uh, hydrogen is the closest to that, not too much beyond uh, 10, but at it, it, critical point, you're, you're now in, uh, it's, a, it's a phase that is nine, none of the above. So 
uh, super critical, essentially. I believe the life support oxygen tanks on the shuttle use super critical storage, if I'm remembering correctly. But one of the benefits in low gravity of uh, going super critical is you don't have to worry about uh, liquid and gas phases and, and separating them and keeping them controlled and so forth. Uh, not usually an option, though, for liquid repulsion systems, although it's been looked at and, and there are concepts for it. So briefly, uh, <clears throat> just to describe uh, Let's take a look at oxygen, for example. Um, if, if you're uh, sitting at one, close to one atmosphere, about one bar, uh, you're gonna be at that normal boiling te point temperature, uh, about 90 K, if the entire tank is saturated. So that means it's been sitting there venting, all the heat coming in is, has gotten uh, the temperature up to saturation conditions in, in the liquid. Uh, the vapor is generally warmed up higher. So everything above this saturation curve for each of these fluids is vapor and below it is liquid. So um, you're going to have saturation at the interface at all times, and you're going to have either saturated or subcooled in the liquid, and then you're going to have uh, superheated in the vapor. Now, if you take that um, saturated, let's say we, again, we have a fully saturated tank, and you pressurize it, let's say, up to uh, three bar, uh, the interface temperature is going to match the saturation curve. So this is good information to know if you're looking at test data. Uh, if you're down below the saturation temperature in any of your sensors, uh, you're in the liquid phase. If you're above it, you're in the vapor phase. And at the interface, it's at that saturation condition. Um, that subcooling in the liquid will take time to warm up by convection and conduction. Then depends on the environment you're in. And um, uh, in the heat coming into the tank will warm it up as well as warming up the all inch. So, um, another thing to keep in mind, so uh, sorry to take a, a lot of time with this, but um, I, I think it's worth thinking through and understanding the, what's going on thermodynamically with these, um, with these tanks. Um, if you had a tank now at three bar that's saturated, let's say it's been sitting there venting at three bar for a long period of time so that the entire liquid's at three, three bar saturation temperature, a little bit about, above 100 uh, K. If you now vented that tank back down to one atmosphere, you're going to get bulk boiling. You know, all of your liquid's going to uh, rapidly boil to get down to the saturation temperature uh, close to 90 K. So uh, those are things to keep in mind. I've seen people who are new to this field will, will tend to have a little bit of um, uh, not confusion, but not sure what's going on in a tank, whether it's going up and down in pressure. And, and I have more description in the, um, in the text in this. If you want to look through it and, and, and read through it, it might be helpful. Um, the other um, uh, introductory information I think is sometimes helpful is uh, what a watt of heat into your tank will do in terms of a saturated tank. Now, keep in mind, as I mentioned, you can have subcooled liquid, so there, there can be um, sensible warming of that liquid before you get to saturation. Uh, but this particular um, chart is, is considering a tank that's saturated uh, at whatever pressure is shown here at the bottom, so between 1 and 10 bar. And what you can see is that for one watt of heating, you get far more uh, boil off in a saturated tank with oxygen more than double than you do with methane and, and quite a bit more than hydrogen as well. Now, of course, one watt uh, of heat input is going to you know, uh, be a different configuration for each of these fluids because of their, their temperature differences. But uh, the, the point is, that this is good to keep in mind, again, as you're looking at how your thermal protection system is working and, and what effect it's going to have on, the, on a boil off in a saturated tank uh, for these different fluids. Okay, uh, let's talk now a little bit about the fluid dynamics. And again, uh, 1G is pretty straightforward. There's a lot of correlations and understanding of what's happening in 1G. Uh, when you start to get into reduced gravity, uh, there's a lot less information and you've got to look at uh, uh, a few of the textbooks that are available that discuss it or, or uh, many of the reports that are available. I, I'm showing as an example here, this was a, a um, uh, CFD, um, I believe it's a CFD model. Uh, created by uh, Greg Zimmerly, uh, showing a, a low Earth orbit uh, notional uh, upper stage where you've got uh, a fuel tank, let's say, and an oxygen tank here. Um, and due to self gravity, the uh, ollage spaces, which are shown here as kind of these spheres in the bluish color, um, uh, tend to um, 
uh, go towards the uh, opposite ends of the tank here. So uh, from a standpoint of feeding an engine, if you're in Leo and you've got this kind of situation, uh, you have to do something uh, to uh, position your liquid over your feed lines. So let's say your feed lines, uh, which they generally are in the aft section of the vehicle. So you're trying to feed the fuel down through a feed line down at the bottom of this tank and the oxidizer down through the bottom of this tank. Uh, you've got to get that uh, ollage up at the top towards the forward part of the tank so that you can pull on the liquid. Uh, so you uh, have to provide a thrust essentially to get that settling. So if you've heard the term settling thrust, that's what it's referring to. Um, these are not simple calculations that you can make. It depends a great deal on the environment, but there are some indications you can get in terms of uh, what kind of acceleration you need. Uh, and one of those um, quick calculations you can do is a bond number, which is ratio of acceleration to capillary forces. Uh, this is the equation for it. You'll sometimes see the uh, density of the vapor dropped off because it's so low and they'll just have the density of liquid. But uh, formally, it's, it's actually the difference between the two. And then this is that acceleration term. So whatever acceleration your environment you're in. And then the free surface diameter, which is important to keep in mind. It's actually the liquid contact diameter uh, against your tank walls and the surface tension is the, um, the other variable in that equation. So I show here as an example, uh, just to try and visualize it. This uh, uh, comes from, uh, I think it was a European Space Agency uh, document. Uh, it's a cylindrical tank, uh, the midline here shown at zero. And it shows the, um, the liquid surface shape depending on that bond number. So at a, at a bond number of 100, um, you get something that's pretty close to flat all the way up to the edges of the tank where you have some meniscus. And then as you start to lower that bond number, which is uh, basically equivalent if everything else is staying the same to having a lower acceleration level, so a lower G, um, that uh, interface becomes more and more uh, curved until you get to a point where it's, uh, if you were to extend this, uh, this interface, you basically have a sphere similar to what I was showing before in that uh, vehicle in the Earth orbit. Um, so uh, that's uh, one, of the, uh, one of the utilities of, of uh, calculating bond number. And I'll have an example a, uh, at the end here that, that shows um, uh, how you might make use of that. Uh, Reynolds number, most folks are familiar with in the thermal fluids field, so I, I, I won't uh, spend too much time on this. Uh, again, some of the definitions, of course, it helps you define whether you're in uh, laminar, transitional, or turbulent uh, conditions in terms of your flow. Um, and here's some of those uh, some of those transition cutoffs, depending on whether you're talking about internal flow or external flow. Uh, and again, you'll sometimes see the subscript D if it's internal flow, that's a hydraulic diameter. If it's uh, external flow, the X is generally the uh, uh, denoting the distance from the leading edge. Um, another dimensionless number very helpful is the Raleigh number for natural convection. Uh, the G term here is where that acceleration comes into effect. Uh, and then new salt number, which uses Raleigh number. And again, these I'm going through these quickly because I'm assuming most of the audience is very familiar with, with these uh, dimensionless numbers. And of course, with the new salt number, you can, you can come up with a convective heat transfer coefficient. Uh, I, Put one example in here that comes out of report for a sphere in, in low gravity. Uh, uh, these are empirically derived, these coefficients, as most of you probably know. Um, uh, this was one for that particular condition, uh, and I use it in one of the examples later. Uh, I put this together. I think it's helpful uh, to get a sense of how much your convection, natural convection, drops when you start to go into a low Earth orbit and other environments. So if you look at that new salt number, uh, in 1G and you, and you know, normalize to that and say that that's 100% of, uh, you know, what you're getting in 1G. As you go down into uh, other environments, say lunar surface, uh, you get about 69% uh, of the value of new salt number that you do in 1G. And then in LEO, it's 5%, 2% translunar space. Uh, this is, again, all using uh, this particular correlation, which I have a footnote below. You wouldn't use that, of course, across all of these, but it just gives you a sense uh, all of these acceleration levels, but it, it does give you a sense of how much your natural convection drops off uh, as you get into those reduced uh, gravity levels. So sort of an intuitive um, uh, feel for it. So I think we're running a little bit, uh, pretty close, 30 minutes. So let me introduce these uh, 
calculation examples. And again, I think in a normal uh, short course uh, type of a setting, uh, we probably take some time to just let everybody walk through these and try them out. Uh, but uh, we don't we don't have either the time or or really the right venue to do that. So I'll just introduce it, and um, I guess let's call it homework <laughs> if you don't mind me using that term. But if you want to uh, access this online, you can you can walk through this more slowly and carefully yourself. And I would appreciate any feedback on these, uh, even you know everything from uh, how to maybe explain the problem better or set it up differently to uh, obviously if you see any calculation errors, that would be great to hear about. So please uh, let me know. And I've got um, in this report an email address you can use for that. But this is, um, and a lot of these examples, uh, I think all of them I use Octogen and a lot of them I refer back to that uh, S4B uh, because it is in a public domain. So uh, you can talk about things like its diameter and so forth. Uh, so this is uh, talking about if you had that tank in two bar, uh, pr two bar pressure uh, in a microgravity environment, so something like Leo. Um, you know, what are the properties? So uh, this is some of the ref prop properties. You could have also gotten them from the uh, NIST uh, web web uh, website um, interactive tool. Uh, the vaporization rate that plot I showed you about the saturation for one watt. Uh, this is how to calculate that. It's very easy. Actually, you just put one watt, which of course is the same as joules per second, divided by the latent heat of vaporization, and you get a, uh, a boil off rate essentially for a saturated tank. Now, again, keep in mind, boil off does not equal uh, venting losses. That doesn't mean you have to vent it. Um, and it also assumes a saturated tank, not a, a tank with subcooled liquid. So there's a lot of caveats to that, but it does give you a sense of um, what your heat leak would be in a saturated tank for that particular fluid under those conditions. And again, if you look back at that figure 1.6, you can see this number uh, falls right on that plot. Uh, the second example is using that bond number. Uh, again, same tank, um, but now looking at um, uh, a spherical tank, if it's in the midline, it has that 6.6 .6 meter diameter. Uh, I think it's mentioned up here. Yeah. Uh, spherical tank. But if you go above or below that in a higher or lower fill level, you have a different free surface diameter. So that starts to affect your bond number. So that's what this um, example is supposed to be demonstrating is how does that bond number change? Of course, if you're in a cylindrical portion of a, of a tank, you're going to have constant free surface area. So it's it's always the same. But uh, as you get into the dome regions, let's say of, a, of a, even a cylindrical tank, you're, you have to think about this. Um, and you can automate uh, the bond number. <clears throat> and again, this is the using Excel uh, to figure out, let's say you want a bond number, or keep uh, for settling purposes, a bond number of 100, uh, just for uh, the sake of, um, of an example. Uh, if you're at the midline of the tank, that's, you're gonna need a certain acceleration level uh, settling to, to get that bond number. But as you go past that midline up or down, uh, You've got to uh, you've got to increase that that uh, settling um, uh, thrust. So um, something to keep in mind. And then the last example is just a convective heat transfer uh, a, a problem. Looking at Raleigh and, and, and the new salt numbers. Um, again, these are probably calculations you're familiar with, so I won't spend a lot of time on them. But uh, see if you can get the same numbers. And again, any feedback would be welcome. Um, running through this particular scenario, you get for a little over four um, watts per meter squared K for the convective heat transfer coefficient. Uh, and that drops down, I think this was uh, 1G, that drops down quite a bit when you go into LEO and plug in the um, acceleration level for that. And a little discussion about the implications of that. So let me, let me pause there. Uh, I'm seeing chats coming and going, and I'm going to have to figure out how to be able to get to those. Uh, uh, I'll tell you what, when we take a break, uh, if you want to continue to uh, put anything in the chat that uh, comes up as we go through this, uh, when we take the 10 minute break at the top of the hour, I'll, I'll try to look through that and address them before we get on to the next uh, topic. <clears throat> okay, so uh, that was the end of the uh, introdu introduction phase. Uh, sorry for the rapid pace. I, I, th I wanted to keep it, uh, I didn't want to go more than three hours because of lunchtime here. So I know I'm moving a little bit quickly, but hopefully at least enough of an introduction that you can go back and look at it if you choose to later. Uh, the next thing I'd like to talk about is environments. And um, you really have to think of environments in terms of mission segment, as I kind of alluded to previously uh, with the concept of operation discussion. Uh, so I talk about that first. 
And then the two environments that really uh, come into play heavily with uh, cryogenic fluid management is what's your acceleration uh, environment that you're in and then what is the thermal environment. So I'm going to touch on both of those and then again some uh, environmental calculation examples. Um, so looking at the mission segments, um, all of these I have a footnote down below that uh, storage is always a, a CFM op or, or operation, I guess you would call it, or, or consideration. Uh, regardless of what segment you're in. So uh, for the sake of not being repetitive, I didn't put that in each of these. But um, this is not, uh, another sort of, I guess, maybe a quick checklist if you're trying to think through uh, your cryogenic fluid management system and, un and, and understand or at least get a, a sense of what's the acceleration, you know, what kind of operations, first of all, that you're going to be seeing. Uh, so, for example, on a pre-launch loading, uh, conditioning, ground hold, and potential launch abort, what acceleration level, normal gravity, free pre-launch, and then what's the thermal uh, uh, conditions you're in, uh, whether solar, air convection, uh, water vapor, condensation, or freezing, perhaps on the outside of your uh, tank if you've got foam insulation. So that's the essence of this. And again, I won't walk you through all the details, but as you go through launch, <clears throat> Earth orbits this lunar um, and then I'm, depending on what astronomical body that you're, um, you're heading towards and then going into orbit around, uh, that's, of course, going to affect your thermal and acceleration environments and descent and ascent and so forth. So, uh, again, this is just sort of a, a checklist of sorts to walk through and, and, and really think about what, you, what CFM operations and, and design that you need to accomplish uh, everything you want to accomplish during all these mission segments. So uh, a little more details about the acceleration environments. Um, I think I can move quickly through here, but again, in space, ascent, descent, surface operations. I have a few examples, so that I thought might be interesting. Uh, this is the um, acceleration profile uh, during Saturn V. Again, this is public information. I've been put out in the public domain now uh, during the Apollo 8 mission. So uh, if you do the... Um, Conversion back to uh, customary units, 32.2 feet per second squared is uh, is 1g. So you can see uh, going up to something you know around or in the neighborhood of 4g's during the, during the launch phase, and then of course as you have various uh, engine cutoffs, you you go rapidly from from that high acceleration level down to something lower until the next engine kicks in, and then of course a big cutoff here uh, back down. So it's interesting to kind of look through this and of course this is going to this is going to vary depending on what the you know launch vehicle and how many stages and so on and so forth but uh, i think it helps to understand what what your cryogen is is um, i guess seeing or or experiencing uh, during each of these phases of, of just the launch phase until you finally get into uh, uh, what they call earth parking orbit here in leo um, uh, which is very low acceleration level so um, just sort of an example of that that's in the public domain. Uh, this is another public domain piece of information that I think is very helpful uh, uh, to keep in mind. Uh, these are data that's based off of uh, two um, acceleration measurement systems that were flown on, um, I think they're both flown on the shuttle on space station, um, but uh, they were customized for different uh, uh, different frequencies uh, and different ranges of accelerations and of course together they cover quite a bit of ground. So this gives you some sense of things like uh, even solar radiation pressure induces some acceleration on a vehicle even if that's the only uh, uh, source of it. And then you have gravity which is never the only source of course and then you have gravity gradient effects. Uh, this is uh, Orbiter Drag is actually the shuttle orbiter uh, just the drag at the altitude it's at from um, um, atomic ox oxygen and whatever other uh, you know molecules that are up there, you get a certain level of uh, environmental um, uh, acceleration just based on that. And then a few other things that are interesting, crew, crew motion, pumps, fans, that sort of thing. And this is the uh, International Space Station requirement. So um, the other one, it's a much older one, but I think it's still uh, kind of useful to, again, uh, get some sense of, of what these acceleration levels is. <coughs> Excuse me, uh, as a report by, I think this was from Ostrak, Ostrak. Um, uh, looking at atmospheric drag, uh, the contributions basically of all of these uh, sources of acceleration, 
uh, for for an air, uh, I'm sorry, a spacecraft in various uh, environments. Um, so these are a little bit hard to read. You can expand them, uh, zoom in, and get a better look at them. But again, just give you a sense all the way down to uh, I think 10 to the minus eight. In some of these uh, 10 to the minus nine gravity gradient. Yeah, 10 to the minus eight in uh, translunar and, and trans Earth orbit. So you can get very low uh, gravity levels in a, in a uh, passive, um, you know, trans uh, cislunar uh, environment. And again, another example uh, that's in the public domain from uh, the Apollo era. This is just the uh, uh, landing. Uh, I think uh, I think this might be a generalized uh, plot up top here, but then this is a specific one for uh, one of the lunar landings, showing the uh, thrust levels uh, and the command is uh, commanded uh, thrust levels are in dash here, but Again, if you look at those thrusts and then you know the spacecraft uh, mass, uh, you can get a sense of what those um, those acceleration levels are. And I have an example problem uh, a little bit more about that. Uh, here's some data that uh, probably isn't, uh, that's far more than what most of us are looking for, I guess, uh, for CFM management. but. Uh, moon and Mars, of course, would be the main ones, but uh, the gravity uh, at the surface end of, of those two bodies, uh, which is helpful, again, for looking at that uh, mission segment and understanding what's going on uh, from a, a thermal and fluid standpoint, and as well as some other information, length of days and that sort of thing. Uh, so that's kind of a, a quick run through acceleration as, as an environment relative to CFM. So now talking about thermal, again, uh, I like to look at it from the standpoint of what mission segment because it changes based on that. Uh, this section has a lot of um, excerpts out of the uh, Disney, which I have referenced down here. I think it's footnote number 33, yeah. Um, and uh, there's a full reference uh, up on the, the earlier page. Uh, so I, I don't, I include enough of it, I think, to at least be able to get a sense of, of um, some of the thermal environments to, to take into consideration. But I would recommend anybody go directly to the Disney, obviously, uh, uh, standard to really um, uh, pull out the most recent data and look at their environments. But again, just to give a sense of it, uh, this is the kind of data that's available for ground ops. Uh, so you've got to look at the ground ops phase, uh, know what kind of um, uh, heat input that you've got coming into your cryo tanks as they're sitting on the pad before launch. And then uh, uh, more of the same. Uh, at launch, then uh, your, your thermal uh, environment changes dramatically because you've got aerodynamic heating as you're going up through the atmosphere. So uh, you, you have a lot of heat flux generally coming in uh, through the sidewalls of your tank. Uh, that's going to again depend on the vehicle and uh, uh, how it, uh, you know, what profile it has in terms of uh, launch profile. Uh, but I, I'm showing here uh, uh, something again from um, from the Apollo program that's in the public domain. Uh, this just gives you a sense, not not necessarily of the uh, of the ascent heating, but how long it takes to. Uh, for the effects of that ascent heating to uh, level off when you get into uh, low Earth orbit. So uh, this is time from uh, uh, burn, uh, first burn cutoff uh, starting at zero. And you can see that there's a high level of uh, heating into the liquid hydrogen in this case for this plot uh, on the Saturn uh, uh, until you in upper stage, until you get into uh, uh, pretty far into the orbit where you start to get what you would expect to see kind of a um, uh, fairly steady state oscillation during the orbit uh, from uh, LB, Earth albedo and solar. Uh, so this, you know, coming from here to here is basically that ascent heating remnants of it that's stored within your vehicle still pumping itself into into the uh, into the cryogen. So it's important to keep that in mind, understand it, and then keep it in mind uh, not just for that phase, but afterwards in terms of thermal soap back. And I'll have a little bit more on that as well uh, in a later section here. Uh, Earth orbit, uh, again, very different environment uh, thermally. Um, a little discussion there about that. And then some of the, again, excerpts from Disney on uh, cold cases, hot cases. Uh, again, just try to put enough in here that you could run through some quick calculations with some of these examples and get a sense of it. Uh, 
uh, cislunar and deep space. Um, There's an equation that I find useful sometimes uh, uh, and with a lot of caveats, but uh, in terms of um, uh, getting a sense of some quick trades and uh, as far as uh, what's going on in, in a cislunar or deep space environment uh, that's affecting your fragile, and, and that's the uh, equilibrium uh, temperature of the spacecraft, which is uh, pretty straightforward to calculate uh, with the solar flux and the um, uh, ratio of projected uh, to um, uh, emitting surface areas as well as the uh, uh, emissivity and uh, or out, um, uh, absorptivity over emissivity ratio. You can come up with an equilibrium temperature. Now, again, uh, the, in, a, in an actual spacecraft, it's going to be hotter, obviously, on the sun side uh, than the space side. But this will give you an equilibrium temperature, which is sometimes useful uh, for uh, shielding. I'll show a little bit later on, uh, trying to understand what a, th a radiation shield is going to help you or solar shield uh, for, for a spacecraft. Uh, lunar orbit, uh, again, taking out of the Disney, some of the equations for uh, uh, sunlight side versus night side. Um, and then surface operations, uh, strictly this is all lunar information. Um, again, being able to characterize some of this only first order, order of magnitude, but, uh, but it does give you a quick uh, a sense of what kind of heat load may be coming into your tank depending on uh, where you are on the lunar surface. Uh, what the um, uh, incidence angle of the uh, sun is and so forth. Uh, more lunar information, again, just to give a sense um, of, uh, of what the environment is on the lunar surface. Uh, I, I think this chart is uh, very helpful in terms of looking at the different latitudes and, and what the uh, bolometric uh, temperature is uh, as a function of uh, time. Uh, more of that. I, I'm so, sorry for uh, going quickly through here. I'm trying to keep to our th uh, three hour for the short course. So I don't want to get uh, hung up too long on any of this. Uh, and then finally, you know, again, this was all stepping through uh, in, uh, thermal environments as a function of mission phase or mission segment, which I think is important. So uh, if you are in a crewed mission, you've got to think about Earth landing, whether it's powered or or, uh, or passive, ablative, whatever, uh, reentry, um, and what those environments are. So that is uh, the end of the thermal environments. Um, I'm going to quickly uh, show uh, these example environments, and then maybe we'll take a 10-minute break, uh, let folks get a bio break, maybe some coffee, and. Uh, and uh, take a look maybe more at some of these problems. But uh, this is a, a quick example of some notional G levels you might see for, for, for a mission pre-launch. Launch, uh, you know, usually 3G, maybe up to 4G if there's if it's a crewed mission. Otherwise, it's dependent on, on, on what G levels uh, constraints or the payload has. Um, without thrust in, in LEO, usually in a microgravity environment. Uh, Cislunar, as I mentioned, can get down as low as uh, 10 to minus 8. Uh, and then lunar ascent, descent. This is um, some data, and I give the, the references down below, where uh, the, the, uh, the, the Apollo uh, lunar module mass was taken into account with those thrust levels to come up with this sort of uh, basic or, or, or uh, rough range of, of G levels during that uh, descent. And then, of course, on the surface and, and Earth return up to 3 Gs as, as you do reentry or or powered landing. Um, this is a quick example of that using that uh, equilibrium skin temperature for cislunar space when you're far enough away from uh, the Earth or the Moon that you don't have to worry about albedo effects. Um, and then uh, how that changes. So the, the first calculation comes up with about 291 K. So this is an example of where even though it doesn't give you an actual spacecraft uh, gradient uh, that you would actually see in space, it gives you a sense of how you can change some of those parameters to uh, to get a better um, or lower heat load into your cryogen tanks. And uh, this is an example of some parametrics run again with Excel, just looking at um, for various uh, ratios of uh, projected over emitted areas. Uh, if you change some of, some of these uh, A over E type of um, uh, ratio, either with uh, surface coatings or 
or the application of reflective um, uh, skin on the outside of the spacecraft, how much of a difference that makes. Uh, so I think this uh, example uh, brings it down uh, by more than 100K with just, I believe, white paint. So kind of interesting to uh, take a look at that. And the final one, just looking at the lunar, uh, uh, some quick sensitivity or, or, or system first order magnitude type look at uh, a lunar uh, environment and uh, what kind of temperatures you might expect there. Okay, uh, <clears throat> I checked the chat room real quick before we jump into the next topic. Uh, just a few things that were brought up. Uh, Jed mentioned that uh, they had done some uh, comparison to cool prop to ref prop and, and found that they compared well and both tools work well. So that's good good feedback. Thanks, Jed, for sharing that. And I, I guess maybe that uh, says that uh, at least at KSC, you can use cool prop, but I don't want to speak out of turn. Maybe that's not the case. Maybe you did that on a different laptop. Um, I also mentioned this is good. I actually caught part of this and it was fantastic. I was, wasn't able to do the whole thing. There's now a lunar thermal analysis guidebook that was a subject of uh, one of the short courses earlier this week. Uh, so um, it's, it's definitely a, a good reference to keep in mind in addition to the Disney. Uh, and uh, that's uh, also, Jed mentioned that, a good, uh, good suggestion. Uh, Brandon also uh, mentioned that the online report uh, doesn't download. Yeah, that's correct. Um, I actually published this initially in April and then found that uh, there's too many things changing in terms of trying to clarify different aspects of it and problems. And I found one typo actually in one of the equations too. So. Uh, I kind of pulled it back into a little bit of a beta mode. So it's always live and available online, but I'm going to hold off on making it downloadable till it feels like it's kind of in a position, uh, condition where uh, I'm comfortable that, you know, having a, a, a lockdown or not lockdown, but a static uh, version of, of floating around is okay. So uh, stay tuned for that. But in the meantime, um, uh, you can always get to it online uh, and hopefully I'll have a version that I, I feel comfortable letting, uh, being available to download in the future. I know that is more more helpful for quick lookups and that kind of thing. Uh, so I'll check again at the next break for more chat stuff. So please, if uh, if you do have any feedback uh, of any kind, including the, the, the method of trying to uh, show this or teach this in a short course from, from reports, first time I've tried that, I'd, I'd welcome that input as well. Uh, so the next topic uh, then we're gonna talk about is uh, a tankage. Um, of course, very important to, uh, to understand and, and, and think about uh, tankage design, uh, packaging, that sort of thing. So I'll start with material properties first and then talk about uh, how the heat loads in, in, in an insulation uh, addresses or mitigates those heat loads. And then a little bit of design and sizing. Again, very system level, first order kind of stuff, but it, it is helpful to sort of zero in on, on feasible trade space in a lot of cases. And then some examples of packaging and integration, and, and as in the other chapters, uh, a few calculation examples. So with material properties, uh, something to keep in mind, and again, folks that have worked in the cryogenics field are familiar with this, but uh, when you're coming new to it, uh, probably the safest thing to always uh, assume is that whatever you're looking at in terms of properties, whether it's thermal physical or material properties, they're, they're going to be nonlinear uh, in function of temperature, in terms of function of temperature. Uh, so if you go in with that assumption, you'll probably be safer because uh, that's probably the first mistake I see people make when they just begin working the cryogenic fields is they'll assume the conductivity of a material or, <clears throat> or the specific heat. Uh, they can just take the average between the, the two temperatures of interest and, and that's going to get them the answer. And uh, sometimes you're not too terribly far off and sometimes you're a lot off depending on how much accuracy you want to have because, uh, uh, and you'll see in a minute here, I'll show some examples, uh, they tend to be very nonlinear. Um, uh, yield and ultimate uh, strength tends to, for, for most solids, uh, gets better as you go down temperature. However, duct ductility is, is the main issue with cryogenic temperatures. So there's uh, uh, that second bullet there is a little bit of uh, uh, just a quick under uh, update or not update, but uh, uh, thoughts about uh, what, to, what to look for in terms of ductility. Um, some materials have become uh, quite brittle, so you've got to be very careful about that. And then uh, other properties, it, it varies. It depends on the material. Um, again, as I mentioned, thermal, thermal properties are very temperature dependent generally, and I'll show you some quick examples of that. Uh, and a few um, sources of information here. 
Uh, let's see. Uh, this was work done by Goddard Space Flight Center. I just want to point that out uh, where they found, I think it was 6061 T6 uh, uh, property data was uh, off, at least uh, compared to their test specimens, uh, compared to the NIST website. So if you're working particularly in 6061 T6, and I, I noticed it actually for Teflon too and some other data, uh, I would encourage you to take a look at that report uh, uh, just to make sure you've covered, I guess, the uncertainty you want to have uh, for those materials. Uh, this is an, a nice little plot. Uh, I should probably shrink it a little bit so you can see the whole thing <clears throat> um, that um, Lakeshore puts out. Lakeshore uh, makes cryogenic instrumentation of various types. Uh, and this has been around for a long time, but it just gives you a sense of just how non uh, nonlinear uh, some of these material properties are. This, in this case, thermal conductivity. So uh, these are both log scales. So even on on dual log scales, uh, very nonlinear uh, things happen to conductivity for a lot of materials uh, as you go from room temperature at uh, you know roughly 300 K down to uh, either liquid hydrogen. Uh, or lower. Uh, this one goes all the way down to helium, of course. So just something to keep in mind. Uh, again, uh, uh, there's other data out there. I give some footnotes about where you can find data on material properties. Uh, there are some available in some textbooks. Um, the two textbooks uh, I tend to go to a lot are, are the one by Flynn, uh, Cryogenic um, Engineering. I had to look at my bookshelf and make sure I got the title right. Uh, a great, great resource, and it's referenced in here a number of times. Uh, the other one, uh, there's a couple actually by Barron. Um, he did uh, one of the earlier cryogenic systems books in the 60s that actually went out of print and then was brought back. Uh, we used to pass around photocopies of it because it was out of print. Now it's back in print again. And he's also got an excellent uh, heat transfer one that I think just he just updated with an edition in the 90s. So. Um, uh, this comes out of Barron's uh, uh, earlier edition heat transfer book, but it, it, it does give you some quick um, values that can be helpful uh, uh, for some quick cal calculations, and then I'll show you where to go for, for more advanced ones. Um, these are uh, conductivity, uh, thermal conductivity for some different materials at, at various temperatures. And then a capital K is the conductivity integral. So that's the integral of conductivity from zero up to whatever temperature this is. So you take, if you're going between two temperatures, you, you subtract those conductivity integrals to, to come up with the um, integrated specific heat, or in this, or in this case, uh, conductivity, integrated uh, thermal conductivity, but you would do the same thing with specific heat. So uh, this is one way to do some quick calculations. Uh, this is also out of Barron. He has uh, shape factors. Uh, the, probably the one most familiar plain wall or slab is just the uh, area divided by the thickness. Uh, but there's other shape factors in here for, for various other geometries that sometimes come in handy for some quick calculations. Uh, this was the, the reference I was mentioning, cryogenic heat transfer by Barron. Actually, this is his early edition. I think he's got a newer one out now that's um, larger. I haven't had a chance to go through it yet. Uh, here's an example of specific heat of stainless steel uh, from 300. Uh, K down to 4K. Uh, this is from NIST with, along with the curve fit for it. Uh, so this is an example of that nonlinearity I mentioned. So if you were trying to uh, look at um, uh, an energy balance, let's say, or an energy transfer between a tank wall that's made of uh, stainless steel, and you, uh, <clears throat> let's say, we're working with liquid uh, uh, hydrogen temperatures down here around 20 whatever K, uh, if you just took an average between that and up to room temperature, <clears throat> you'd pick some point here uh, and, and come up with a, a value that was uh, uh, not really uh, adequately representing that integral all the way up from 20 to 300 K. So um, again, something to keep in mind, whether that's going to cause you an error that's a problem or not depends on what calculations you're running, but uh, it's good to know it and understand it. Uh, this is a very useful tool um, because of my experience trying to uh, bounce out of this and into other uh, tabs. I'm not going to do it. I, the WebEx um, kind of bars get in the way. But but if you click on this, um, it actually, uh, in the example problem, I have a screenshot of it so you get a sense of it. But you can uh, pick uh, all kinds of materials and then what property and then the two temperatures you're interested in. And it'll, it'll calculate the uh, thermal uh, 
uh, conductivity integral or the specific heat integral for that. So I, I've started using that um, uh, quite a bit. It saves a lot of time and uh, grunt work uh, on our end. Uh, this is another example. This is uh, conductivity. The, the other one was specific heat. This is conductivity now for, I think it's still stainless steel. Yeah, 304 stainless steel. And I just plotted on here a, a couple of different um, data sources. So this is NIST's um, uh, put fits the, the kind of pinkish colored uh, square uh, boxes. Uh, the triangle or diamond ones are the ones from Barron out of the book that I mentioned previously. <clears throat> and then um, when all else fails, uh, if you've got data like this, in this case, you can go to the NIST website and you know, come up with the integral. But if you've got some unusual material where you, where you don't have um, curve fit data yet, uh, you can actually do a curve fit in Excel. Uh, this is a polynomial curve fit, and then you can come up with errors and uncertainties and so forth. But uh, the nice thing, of course, about a polynomial curve fit is it's easy to integrate. Uh, so you can do the integral yourself. Um, so this is an example then, if you're trying to uh, uh, do solid conduction, uh, again, you've got to do that integral between uh, the two temperatures, your hot and cold temperature, uh, with this uh, shape factor uh, and the uh, conductivity integral uh, being the same, uh, you know, different formulation of, of what you see on the left-hand side of that um, equal sign. And again, I have an example problem. Where I'll show how to work this out. Uh, this would be these would be using, for example, the table I, I ex excerpted from Barron's book uh, up above. Uh, this would be heat absorbed uh, or dissipated from, let's say, a tank wall, mass times the integral of uh, specific heat times the uh, temperature difference. Um, and then uh, I mentioned the work uh, by Tunnel at uh, Goddard Space Flight Center. This is the curve fit that um, they use for in their report along with some of the uh, coefficients uh, for various materials. And again, I would particularly, it was Wes Johnson that pointed this out to me, uh, that aluminum 6061 uh, is where they showed a, a variation that was significant enough uh, for, for their case. I think they were doing a specific spacecraft mission uh, that um, um, uh, what they came up with uh, was, was different from what NIST had for that material. So. Uh, this is, uh, I think, a link, yeah. Oh, this is a different one. So uh, the Tuttle one I have earlier. Uh, this link here, again, I'm, I'm not going to click it, uh, but um, uh, I found it's a nice, uh, uh, Weisland put together a nice uh, reference of um, material sources. So uh, if you're having trouble finding uh, a problematic material that you can't find data in cryogenic uh, temperatures, uh, and there's quite a few of them, um, this is a nice uh, uh, quick PDF. It just gives a list of different sources that they found uh, to, to get that data. So that's kind of a quick, uh, I guess, tour of material properties. Let's talk about uh, heat loads next. Um, you know, there's various heat loads coming into your uh, cryogenic tank, and I'll show a, a, a graphic in a minute to kind of visualize it. but. You've got radiative heat, heat sources, of course. You've also got structures and piping that, that, that are basically mounted or, or, or penetrate the tank wall, so that's going into your cryogen. Uh, you've also got to consider your type of insulation, their thickness, and then there's always uh, degradation factors, particularly with multi-layer insulation, and we'll, we'll chat about that a little bit too in a minute. Uh, in terms of heat loads, uh, there's various ways to, uh, to approach this, but uh, one of the ways that's commonly used is to, to have margin based on the uh, development phase or, or the maturity of the design. So uh, this is, a, a, I think, out of the mill spec. So it tends to have more military review, uh, although some of these are very similar to what we use but, uh, at NASA. But a, a program go ahead, 50% margin uh, is, is what's uh, specified in mill standard 50. 1540C, uh, and then you keep reducing that as your as your uh, design matures. Um, I found that um, adding these margins is best to do at the system level. Uh, we just had a project recently where we had this kind of um, conversation about it and decided on that. Uh, you got to be careful that these margins don't kind of creep their way in at the subsystem or even component levels, and then you've got a whole bunch of margin that you didn't know you had uh, kind of built in. Uh, so uh, just may maybe a, a word of caution about that. But uh, so here's an example of some of those uh, 
some of those heat sources on a, um, and this is out of, I think, no, yeah, this is the later ed edition, 92 of that uh, liquid uh, 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 rocket engines book by uh, Hu Zong Wang. Um, so uh, this is just showing kind of a, another one of these uh, common bulkhead uh, configurations where you've got a, uh, a fuel tank, looks like the fuel tank is below here, an oxidizer tank, although I don't know if it's pointed out. Anyway, oh, I'm sorry, it is a fuel tank at the top. Fuel tank at the top uh, uh, and oxidizer, uh, oxidizer at the bottom. But if you start to look at the heat loads that are coming in, so you've got uh, heat loads coming through the sidewalls, you've got heat loads coming in uh, when you pressurize, you bring in warm pressurant, uh, if it is warm pressurant, which often is, uh, that's adding uh, energy into your system and heat. Um, you've got uh, heat transfer that's occurring between its bulkhead uh, that's dependent on the material and whatever insulation is between it. Um, uh, this is more of the pressure line. Uh, feed lines, if you've got feed lines that are coming uh, through the tank, which is a des common design, or even in some way thermally connected to, to another tank, uh, that becomes a, a source as well as uh, thermal soak back from the engine after an engine burn, uh, your heat transfer then comes up uh, through that feed line into uh, either the fuel tank or the oxidizer tank. I think that covers most of them, but I, I, I find this visualization sometimes helpful just to kind of think through all the different ways uh, heat is coming into your into your crowd and, and, and to really uh, think carefully about how to quantify that and, and take it into account. Uh, insulation, uh, there's a number of choice, uh, choices here. Uh, a lot of these are out of Flynn's book. Um, some of them are a bit dated, but, but I think they give you some sense uh, in a very big picture way of, uh, of what, uh, what options you have. So uh, when you're talking about a tank, you know, the first, of course, uh, option is a bare metal tank. So uh, then you can start to think about, do you want to polish it, do you want to paint it, uh, and then what kind of heat leak are you going to have into it? And of course, it's not practical for some for some propellant fluids, but uh, for the higher temperature ones, uh, uh, sometimes you can get away with it. Um, so here's some uh, total emissivities uh, for some different um, materials or coatings or, uh, you know, I think is there paint in here? I believe there's paint. Maybe I have it in a different chart. So again, just to give you some sense of emissivities there. Um, <clears throat> uh, the next step then, of course, would be to go to some type of a uh, foam or, um, or gas field insulation, such as perlite. Uh, in the case of uh, a perlite or, or other loose uh, fills, you'd have to have, of course, a containment wall on between the, uh, the fluid containment wall and then the outer wall. Uh, for foam, you can put it directly onto the wall. And I have some examples of that um, that's, that have been flown, of course, um, shuttle external tank being one that most people are familiar with. But these are some different uh, foam powder uh, fibrous insulations and some of their uh, effective thermal conductivities. Just uh, again, I find these tables interesting to kind of uh, uh, do quick scoping just to take a look at, you know, and so that you can drop them uh, very quickly into some hand calculations and say, okay, this is outside of the feasibility of what we need in terms of um, thermal performance or not. <clears throat> and then uh, your best performance in a vacuum environment is going to be with multi-layer insulation. <clears throat> and there's a lot of configurations and build-up techniques that have been tried over the years. Um, here's some examples of those. Again, this is out of Flynn's book, <clears throat> uh, looking at different types of radiation shields. So uh, again, for folks that aren't familiar with uh, multi-layer insulation, uh, there's always a, a radiation shield that, that uh, is highly reflective. Uh, and then there's some type of um, uh, either a spacer material or some other mechanism to support with low conductivity uh, those radiation shields so they don't touch each other and, and cause a thermal short. So that's the general configuration for, for multi-layer insulation. And these are some, again, just as a scoping mechanism, looking at some um, uh, different layup types and, and ways of doing that and what, and what kind of performance you can get out of them. Um, one thing, and I, I, I probably can't say this enough, is uh, be very careful um, uh, when you're looking at MLI performance data, data particularly when it's from calorimeter data, uh, that you know, you're, you're gonna have degradation factors in any tank applied MLI that's going to uh, significantly lower the performance uh, of that system, 
uh, when it's actually put onto a tank. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about some of those degradation factors, but uh, just be very careful about that. That's another, um, uh, I guess, common mistake I've seen for people that are beginning to look into this is they'll take uh, some calorimeter data and assume that they can get that performance on a tank applied system. And, and usually you can't even, you know, you're not gonna get that close. Uh, um, here's another set of slides. Let me see if I can blow this up uh, or, or plots, I should say, again, from Flynn. Uh, the values aren't necessarily uh, uh, as interesting because it's going to depend on, on, on the configuration of the multi-layer insulation, but, but I think the trends are, are good to keep in mind. Uh, so let's start off with the, the most obvious ones or the ones that I guess are more intuitive. Uh, the first one being the warm boundary temperature. So as you'd expect, uh, as your warm boundary temperature increases, your heat flux also increases through, through MLI. Uh, what's interesting is that the cold boundary temperature doesn't have a big effect in, in these uh, low ranges, say, uh, you know, liquid hydrogen up through liquid oxygen and, and, and methane. And I'll show a, a plot that kind of shows that in a little differently uh, uh, further on here. Uh, but uh, again, that's intuitive. You'd expect that it's, it's going to go up as, as your boundary temperature goes up. Uh, the other thing that's probably intuitive is the more radiation shields or the more layers you have in your MLI, uh, the better your performance. Uh, to a point, and I'll show show that uh, trend in, in the next one down. But so again, your heat flux will drop as you add more layers. Um, the one that's uh, not necessarily as intuitive is uh, if if you have MLI and now you have a compressive load on it uh, for whatever reason, either because of the packaging or or mispackaging, maybe in some cases. Uh, what happens is you apply a load to those those uh, layers of um, of uh, reflective shields, uh, which in most modern uh, configurations is a double luminized mylar. So uh, mylar aluminized on both sides, you know, think of a party balloon. And then, um, you know, Dacron uh, netting often uses the spacer material. So if you take that, that configuration and you start to compress it, uh, you're increasing uh, the uh, contact conductance of those spacing materials against the MLI, and you may even be creating a few shorts in certain places. So, so as that applied load goes up, uh, you, uh, you actually get an increase in the uh, effective conductivity uh, through the MLI, uh, which you don't want typically. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, the other one, and again, the numbers aren't as important here because it depends on your, your configuration of your MLI. Uh, but there, there is an optimal uh, layer density. So that's how many layers, let's say, per, per centimeter um, uh, that you put into your MLI radiation shields. Uh, and you'll find an optimum, generally, uh, uh, where your uh, thermal conductivity is, is at a, a minimum. Um, so that's, that's a factor. Um, this is in the public domain I can share, but I can tell you there's uh, lots of other information, um, uh, much of which NASA has done that, that gives a lot more uh, data on that and how to, how, to, uh, how to analyze that. But just understanding those, those four trends, I think, is, is a good uh, start when, when you're looking at MLI and starting to consider it for, for a CFM system. Um, Sophie, I'm, I think I'll talk about that down here. So that's um, spray-on foam insulation. Uh, this is another uh, chart. I, th I think the first time I saw it uh, was when uh, Wes Johnson did a, uh, a crowd course a number of years back. Um, I think he uh, shared the slides. I was going to try to make that bigger, but it got too big. Uh, I think this is a fantastic slide that uh, I think came out of um, work that he and uh, James Fessmeyer and others at the uh, KSC Crowd Lab did over the years of different insulation types. And um, what it shows is um, the performance in terms of apparent thermal conductivity on this axis uh, with the, uh, with the uh, pressure, uh, vacuum pressure um, in an annular space, let's say around a, uh, so a vacuum jacketed uh, is often called uh, uh, either pipe or, or tank. Um, one atmosphere, I think it's about 760 uh, uh, tor. So it's a, it, all of these uh, data points here are at one atmosphere. And then of course you're getting down into the hard vacuum here. So uh, there's a lot of information here, but let me just point out a few things. If you're in the um, uh, hard vacuum range, uh, MLI type uh, solutions are gonna give you your best performance. And uh, of course the issue with MLI is, is as that vacuum, uh, you start to lose that hard vacuum, even a soft vacuum, MLI performance drops pretty dramatically. So. 
this is why um, you know keeping uh, uh, vacuum jacketed tanks and, and piping pumped down appropriate to the hard vacuum is so important. Uh, and it's also important to keep in mind if you've got uh, an environment uh, where you, you can't hold vacuum uh, through the entire mission phase, let's say. So, for example, you might you might be able to get a hard vacuum, obviously, if you're in LEO or in, in a cislunar uh, situation. But uh, getting there on the way there, you're, you're not going to be in a vacuum. So um, on the other end, um, I've worked with some private sector companies looking at uh, ways of um, insulating liquid hydrogen tanks don't require vacuum jacketed walls when they have a high enough consumption rate. Uh, so if you start to look at things like uh, foam spray on uh, uh, foam insulation, um, aer aerogel blankets and so forth, this gives you a sense of what works best at, at one atmosphere. So um, again, it, this is one of those charts I think you could spend a lot of time talking about looking at and, and getting different insights, but I just wanted to at least uh, uh, mentioned some of the key things I think you can pull out of that. Now, the recent uh, shiver testing that was done uh, out at uh, what used to be Plum Brook, now Armstrong uh, Test Center, um, <clears throat> I think a lot of really good data, speaking of uh, tank applied uh, MOI and how that actually uh, performs. And uh, one of the things that, uh, that Wes Johnson shared with me on this is that uh, one watt per meter squared uh, at both liquid hydrogen and liquid nitrogen temperatures uh, with 30 layers was kind of a, a good, um, uh, you know, again, order of magnitude performance uh, to, to consider for MLI uh, at, the, at, that, uh, at that layers, a number of layers, which can be done with an inch or, or maybe a plus or minus a little bit. Um, so for first order uh, or, or rough order magnitude looks at what MLI can buy you, uh, this isn't a bad uh, initial heat flux to uh, to consider. <clears throat> and um, when you take that heat flux, this was the other way I was mentioning, uh, showing how cold boundary uh, temperature um, starts to become less important if, you're, if your warm boundary temperature is up to room temperature. Uh, this is the um, effective emissivity uh, of one watt per meter squared, uh, just using this simple equation here. Uh, at different cold boundary temperatures, uh, depending on what the hot boundary temperature is. And you can see that if you're, uh, for one watt uh, per meter squared, you can see if you're around room temperature, they all kind of converge to the same value. And I think I have it written up here, 0 0.002, yeah, yeah, effective emissivity. So between those two, uh, again, is a very first cut system level uh, trade space uh, uh, sort of uh, quick look at, at what might be worth looking at using that sort of a heat flux and that sort of an effective emissivity, and you can convert that to E star, I have a footnote down there. Uh, you can take a quick look at some, um, uh, the addition of MLI to a particular packaging uh, scenario and see, see if it makes sense or if it's worth considering on a more detailed basis. Uh, so uh, that's a heat load, quick look at heat loads and insulation. Um, looking at uh, design and sizing, uh, with a bit more information, you can start to begin to size uh, your tanks and get a sense of uh, how big they have to be to hold the amount of propellant you have um, and based on the operating pressure you're expecting and the materials you're using. So uh, that's the sense of that. Um, there's a few equations. Uh, this, these are pretty straightforward, but uh, you can calculate the volume of the tank, of course, by figuring if you know how much propellant you need uh, whether fuel or oxidizer, you divide by the uh, density of the liquid and then multiply by one minus the uh, fill fraction. Uh, uh, that's the, I'm sorry, over, that's negative one, so that's in the denominator. Uh, that'll give you the volume of the tank that you need. Uh, this, this, I'm sorry, this is the, um, not the fill fraction. This is your constraint or, or uh, minimum haulage fraction. I misspoke on that. So, so for example, if you, if you say you want to, um, uh, have uh, highest fill level is going to be a 5% uh, haulage fraction. You can figure out how much of a tank volume you need. And again, that density uh, for the liquid, you can get out of the NIST on, online or ref prop or cool prop. Uh, so with that equation, um, you, you can understand uh, roughly first order again, uh, what volume of tank you need for fuel and oxidizer. And then based on the geometry of your tank, uh, and this is an example of a, a cylindrical tank barrel section with uh, dome ends, which is very common. 
uh, you can uh, calculate then uh, all of the uh, <clears throat> information you need. So in this table, I have uh, volumes and uh, surface areas, wetted wall area, interface area <clears throat> for uh, different types of uh, tank shapes. And of course, uh, you know, cylinder um, for volume doesn't matter whether it's vert vertical or horizontal. It does when you start talking about wetted areas. But uh, between all of these types, spheres, cylinders, elliptical heads, um, and then here's one of the cylinder and elliptical ends, uh, you can basically put these together to come up with most of the geometries that you'll commonly see, included, uh, including a common bulkhead where you have an inverted uh, elliptical end, so you would subtract the volume in that case. So um, once you have a tank volume, and again, this is starting now at the very you know, high level system, uh, uh, looking at uh, what kind of a general design you're going to be using. Uh, the next thing you, you might be interested in understanding is what's your minimum wall thickness. And uh, I'll put a caveat on this one too. Again, uh, this is a minimum wall thickness based on, on very simple tensile hoop stress calculations, or I'll show a little bit later buckling. Um, so you're going to obviously have much thicker, in some cases, uh, wall thicknesses where you've got structural supports or uh, other places where you've got to beef up the tank. But, but where this is helpful is it is at least uh, beginning to get an understanding of uh, what kind of uh, minimum wall thickness you're going to need. And then, of course, what, what, what mass does that translate into? So this is a uh, minimum wall thickness based on hoop stress for a cylinder. Um, and based on, of course, the pressure differential, the uh, uh, radius of the, of the cylinder, and then the uh, ultimate tensile strength uh, and a factor of safety uh, for tensile. Uh, same equation, only in this case for a sphere. Uh, now, if, you're, if you've got a buckling load, and of course the difference now between whether you're going to use uh, one of the hoop stress equations or, or some of the buckling equations I'm going to show below is, is whether the pressure is, uh, the, the, the pressure differential between the inside of your tank wall and the outside is positive or negative. So in other words, if you've got um, higher pressure on the outside of your tank wall, your failure mode is not going to be uh, tensile. It's going to be it's going to be a geometric buckling of, of that wall, um, and that's uh, can be calculated by a set of equations I'm going to show here. Uh, the conditions that can come into play uh, commonly are, if, of course, if you have a vacuum jacketed wall, um, that outside wall is is going to be subject to uh, a buckling load because you've got if you're at, in a normal atmosphere. So if you're Let's say on Earth with a vacuum jacketed wall, you're going to have uh, one atmosphere on the outside and then, of course, the hard vacuum on the inside. Uh, the other one that comes into play more with uh, launch vehicles and, and other vehicles, if you have a common uh, a common wall, a common dome between your uh, fuel and oxidizer tank, uh, you want to make sure you don't uh, uh, exceed the buckling, uh, maximum buckling load uh, across that dome. Uh, between uh, the, uh, the the oxygen and, and the fuel tank, so uh, one of the um, uh, criteria to look at is the critical buckling length uh, shown here, best based just on the diameter and the wall thickness. And then if uh, if it's above that critical length, it's considered a a long cylinder, and uh, this equation can be used uh, with uh, Poisson's ratio and uh, modulus of elasticity. Uh, mu and E here, uh, along with that pressure differential um, radius of the uh, cylinder. And then in this case, the factor of safety, I did not make sure it's, it's Buckling's factor of safety, and I'll, I'll mention why you want to use a different factor of safety for that. Um, so that's for a long cylinder. If it's if it's not above that critical length, uh, it's either intermediate or short cylinder. And the method that uh, it, in this uh, reference that I use here, theory of design for, uh, pressure vessel was by Harvey. Um, he indicates that there's no criteria to, to, to determine between intermediate or short. So you basically just run both calculations and you figure out which is your, which produces your thickest wall and then, then you're covered in terms of buckling, um, uh, protecting for buckling. Uh, sphere buckling, different equation, uh, same uh, variables. Um, but uh, one of the things to keep in mind is you, you generally want to have a, a much higher factor of safety on buckling because uh, it can be, uh, there's manufacturing defects and geometric defects in particular uh, that can impact that, that buckling load. So uh, 
I think the example problem I have coming up will show that a little bit better. Uh, dry masses, um, uh, you can start to calculate dry masses again based on its minimum wall thickness, and then you may want to add uh, some amount of, um, uh, of weighting uh, to, for, for areas of your tank where you've got to beef it up for various uh, structural connections or what have you. Uh, but you can use those same um, uh, volume calculations. You just, you know, uh, use the outer wall diameter and then subtract out uh, the volume of the inner wall. And you've got you've got a, a volume of your dry mass multiplied by the density of the material. So uh, pretty straightforward to do. Um, packaging and integration, I thought I'd just show some quick examples. Again, these are all in the public domain of uh, different types of packaging for uh, for tanks. Uh, again, for folks that are in this field, you've probably seen these before, but if you're if you're just starting to uh, to work in this area, maybe some of this provides some uh, insight into how these tanks are built or what they look like. Um, uh, the largest one, of course, is, uh, uh, well, the largest ground liquid hydrogen, I should say, uh, Dewar is the new one at launch uh, complex 39B, um, uh, which is 125 million gallons of uh, usable liquid hydrogen, just to give you a sense of how large these can get. And that has an uh, internal diameter, I believe, around 80 feet. Um, so uh, let me get jump down to the pictures here. You can get down, I'll mention quickly, you can, for those very large doers for liquid hydrogen, you can get down to half a percent per day boil off. Now, as you, as you get into smaller scale, that, that usually goes up. However, you can uh, uh, either reduce it or eliminate it with a cryo refrigeration system, which will be the topic for the, for the next uh, active report that, that I'm gonna be working on. Uh, but in this passive one, we won't, we won't touch on that just yet. Uh, here's a schematic of some of, of ground, uh, uh, I think these might be, both pictures might be liquid hydrogen. Yeah, I believe they are. Uh, but it's uh, generally applicable to uh, liquid oxygen, uh, liquid nitrogen, what have you. Um, this came out of Flynn's book. Uh, you see it in a lot of places. It's a nice, nice schematic of some of the general um, components that you see in a ground system. Uh, this is vacuum jacketed, so when we talk about a vacuum jacket, it's the inner wall holding the fluid, and then the outer wall that is structural and in between is whatever insulation you're using. So this is kind of uh, denoting, for instance, perlite, or, or uh, uh, in the case of the new uh, launch uh, complex 39B liquid hydrogen, it's glass beads that are in here. But this can also be MLI uh, wrapped around the uh, inner tank. Um, you have a pressurization system of some type uh, providing, uh, you know, in this case with a diffuser, providing pressurization so you can do pressurized uh, transfers or, or pressurized uh, enhanced pumped uh, transfers. Um, in this case, it's showing it's also plumbed into a, a vent line. Um, fill and drain lines, uh, these can sometimes be dip tubes that come in through the top and get down to the bottom. In this case, it's coming out the bottom. Uh, if it is a bottom, uh, uh, fill and drain line, you need to have that trap in there uh, so that you're not uh, dropping liquid down constantly and boiling off. So uh, those are a few of the, I, I guess, features of just about any ground-based uh, Dewar um, tank. And by the way, Dewar is, is the term used for a vacuum jacketed uh, tank like this. Um, it's uh, used for cryogen storage. Uh, here's an, more examples of some ground-based systems. Uh, here's two vacuum jacketed cylindrical tanks uh, that were used for no vent fill testing um, back in the late 80s and early 90s. And then an example uh, uh, piping schematic showing how um, you know the, you plumb these uh, can plumb these two tanks together. Um, these happen to use air ejectors, so you, we could get down below uh, atmospheric to do tests with subcooled, uh, uh, densified um, cryogens, um, and then various injection techniques and so forth. Uh, generally, you uh, want to have uh, liquid nitrogen on hand for cold shocking your system. I don't know if I have a lot of discussion about that, but uh, you'll see that if you're wondering sometimes in some of these fluid schematics, why is there liquid nitrogen? If it's a, a high liquid hydrogen system, that's often the reason. Uh, and then you can have various uh, pressure and sources, of course. Uh, this is another example of a ground-based test. Uh, let me start on the right. This is actually, again, what used to be Plumbrook, now Armstrong. Uh, I believe this facility is, is currently mothballed. I don't know that it's active right now, but it was K-Site. 
this was a vacuum chamber, so you're looking at the vacuum chamber uh, door opening. Uh, and then inside of that was, uh, I think there's about a five foot diameter uh, tank, which is now shown close up here. Uh, so during testing, this door is closed and pulled on hard vacuum, and then this tank would be uh, insulated with MLI. Uh, and this picture is shown just for, so you can see where the sensors are and so forth and the camera uh, shown here. So this was a flight weight tank. So it has the thinness uh, appropriate to a, to a uh, flight tank. I think it was an aluminum tank. Uh, again, just trying to show examples of, of how these tanks look on the ground. So if you're looking at uh, test articles, uh, you can get into, uh, you know, examples like this where they're going into a vacuum chamber of some type that may or may not have a, uh, a uh, cold wall of some type to provide uh, the boundary temperatures. Or you could be in a vacuum jacketed uh, tank. Uh, and then, of course, all the ground systems are generally vacuum, vacuum jacketed, certainly for liquid hydrogen. Uh, another example, this is another one of those uh, tanks. I think it might have been the same tank actually that went into there uh, with some MLI testing that was done for a um, variety of tests back in the uh, same time period, late 80s, early 90s. And another uh, spherical tank that was used for methane testing more recently, uh, 2000 something. I can't remember the exact day, uh, year, maybe 2005, six time frame. Um, or a little bit earlier, but it shows some of the tank internals. I think this was a thermal dynamic vent system, which again, be covered in a later report, but um, same sort of uh, things that you saw in the previous, uh, uh, are gonna be common uh, in the previous schematic uh, to all tanks in terms of needing a pressurization source, a way to drain the tank. This I think used a tip tube. Uh, and I think this was an access uh, uh, down here and then structural support of different types. Uh, this is a, a couple of photos uh, from the published uh, photos on the shiver test showing the uh, MLI uh, multi-layer insulation uh, uh, installed at the top of the tank uh, and then a cylindrical section. Um, there is a cold wall in there. I'm not sure if it was used for this test. I think these tests were done at room temperature, but uh, you can refer to the, to the uh, footnotes and look at the references. So those are ground systems, <clears throat> excuse me, I wanted to separate out uh, tank packaging and, and tank uh, tankage uh, design and so forth, uh, uh, depending on what their purpose is. So those kind of are, is a quick look at, at ground-based systems. Uh, launch vehicles, of course, are, are quite different. <clears throat> um, usually um, the engine feed is, is high enough that uh, thermal performance after you get off the pad and, and begin the launch, uh, uh, doesn't require the kind of uh, thermal protection that you need for ground systems that are sitting for a long time and trying to store the cryogen. So as a result, you have a lot of single wall design and this is, uh, the, sorry, single wall designs with um, uh, foam insulation, for example, like the shuttle external tank. So this is a, a photograph turned sideways of the shuttle external tank and then a cutaway view uh, of what it looks like on the inside. So the uh, Liquid hydrogen is at the uh, bottom uh, here, liquid oxygen at the top. And that foam, spray on foam insulation, I think it was about one inch thick, provides just enough um, uh, thermal uh, uh, performance so that uh, to mitigate uh, condensing out air constituents uh, when the tank is full and, and to mitigate the buildup of uh, frost and so forth. So, um, but it, it's uh, it's going to have a much higher boil off rate, of course, sitting on the pad than, than one of the ground systems that's vacuum jacketed with MLI, for example. Uh, this is a picture of one of the SLS, I believe, yeah, SLS cryogenic propellant tanks. I'm assuming it's the oxygen tank. Uh, just to give you another, again, a sense of uh, this is sort of a, a squat, uh, a cylindrical barrel section with uh, two domed ends uh, of what these uh, launch vehicle tanks look like. And of course, the longer uh, uh, ones of its hydrogen, this tends to be a much longer barrel section. Uh, and then finally, uh, some of the work that has been done research-wise on uh, composite tanks. Um, I won't talk a lot about the composite tanks here. The, you know, the, the promise or, or the, uh, uh, the advantages of composite tanks is much lighter weight potentially, uh, but but there's also a lot of uh, challenges with them, uh, particularly with liquid hydrogen, uh, although certainly true with the other, uh, some other uh, propellants as well. Um, 
you know, failures tend to be so stochastic and uh, a lot of times based on defects that, that are hard to detect uh, compared to, you know, standard uh, metal, metal wall materials. But there's a lot of advancements being made here. Uh, private sector is looking a lot at this right now, especially in the aerospace uh, aircraft um, uh, industry, as well as uh, uh, commercial launch vehicles. So um, stay tuned. There's more more coming there. And of course, um, there, you can also have, it doesn't have to be all composite. It can have a metal in, inner liner, which uh, shares the, the um, load then with the, um, with the overwrap composite. Uh, those tend to be easier to integrate and uh, um, but you also pay a penalty in terms of math. So uh, spacecraft cryogenic systems <clears throat> uh, historically uh, have, have, have all, a lot of them been either life support or, uh, or instrument cooling. Um, you know, the current work in exp uh, exploration projects is starting to take liquid propellants all the way to potentially to the uh, lunar surface or soon to the lunar surface. So. Um, that hasn't been done before, to my knowledge. Uh, this is an example of um, one of NASA's design. So this is again in a public domain, um, just to give it a, a sense of um, packaging of these tanks for uh, something that would be a lander, say on, a, on the lunar surface. So uh, you've got the fuel tanks kind of wrapped around a central area, uh, crude habitat. Uh, you can see the descent engine down below here and other, other components. So. Uh, again, I, th I think it, it's kind of good to see how these tanks are come together for the for some of these designs to understand uh, what kind of thermal environment they're going to see. Because, for example, a tank sitting here is going to be seeing maybe uh, at least in this photo or uh, image uh, depiction uh, solar radiation coming in from one side, and then it's going to be seeing some reduced uh, temperature boundary on the other side where the other tanks are located and something different on the bot bottom of the top. So all those have to be taken into account. Okay, uh, a few tankage uh, examples that I'll run through quickly. Um, uh, this is a tank uh, sizing for a spherical tank. Um, this is based on, yeah. So uh, just looking at the volume based on, on a, uh, how much uh, propellant needs to be stored. And then, um, uh, a little bit of a rearranging of the equation to show that you can you can also figure out uh, fill level or um, haulage fraction or whatever you want uh, later on in the mission segment if you know one of the other variables. Uh, another example here, uh, calculating some uh, minimum thicknesses. And again, we, we don't have a lot of time, so I apologize for having to move through here quickly. But uh, this is an example of, um, we talked about how some of the materials change at uh, cryogenic temperature. This is an example of um, some of the 300 series stainless steels and how they increase in um, tensile strength actually as, as they get colder. So depending on um, your risk posture and your design and whether or not your, your tank is going to be only under pressure uh, or under uh, maximum pressure at cryogenic temperatures, you, you may be able to take uh, advantage of some of these uh, improvement in material properties. Um, and that's what uh, some of this, this example points out. And then I think there's a buckling, uh, a buckling example in here too. And finally, uh, tank conduction radiation heat loads. Um, again, using the early stuff we talked about with Baron, uh, with the thermal up, thermal conductivity integral, how to use that with a shape factor, example of that. Uh, and then uh, uh, radiative heat transfer to a tank wall. Uh, I think this is with, oh, these are between two tanks. Yeah, so you can sometimes do some quick, easy uh, uh, ray diffuse uh, calculations to see uh, what kind of temperature, I'm sorry, what type of heat flux you're getting between two tanks that are in close proximity. So if you're thinking, think again of that, uh, those tanks packaged together on the uh, lunar lander I sh uh, depiction I showed, uh, you, you could do some uh, calculations of, uh, of how much uh, heat transfer is occurring between those tanks, or if they're mounted uh, bottom and top in, in a vehicle uh, structure, uh, what's happening between them, and then what different uh, treatments or perhaps application of MLI might, might do in terms of helping that. And uh, this is another parametric plot that's uh, showing some of that between two uh, parallel plates uh, by changing the effective emissivity. And if you remember, I mentioned uh, 
uh, 30 layers of MLI uh, with a warm boundary temperature near room temperature gives you an effective emissivity about in this range, I believe it was. Uh, you can see how much that can drop down your heat flux compared to uh, to higher emissivities of standard uh, metals or uh, tank it's tanks that are looking at each other. Okay, we're uh, we're in the home stretch here. I promised to be done by noon because I didn't want anybody to miss lunch, particularly myself. So uh, let's move through the rest of these. Uh, uh, what I'm going to cover next is venting. Uh, one of the things, of course if you have to vent that, that is of interest uh, for your mission is how much propellant is lost during that process. Uh, on the upside, uh, you have the opportunity to use that, that venting for propulsive settling. So I'll, I'll have a f uh, some equations to use for some quick looks at that, as well as cooling capacity. Uh, you can use that vented gas to cool uh, various other uh, components on your spacecraft, either to lower the heat load into your tankage or, or actually to intercept the heat coming into your tanks. And then a, a peculiarity that happens in low gravity situations when you're venting where you can uh, end up with a lot of uh, vapor that's um, trapped within your um, liquid uh, layer. I'll talk a little bit more about that and causes a kind of a frothy, bubbly uh, level rise that could get up into your vent and cause you to vent uh, liquid, which is bad, uh, and then vent calculations. So uh, let me start with venting. Um, just a general look at it. Uh, if you have a tank that's locked up, you know, and it's got properties, temperature, pressure, and so forth, you vent it, um, you're going to have uh, of course, whatever's all inch gas is in there is going to vent out down to whatever your final pressure is. Uh, if you're subcooled uh, relative to that final pressure, that is your liquid is below the saturation temperature, uh, your bulk liquid uh, relative to the final pressure, the amount of um, uh, vapor that you generate is going to be fairly small. In other words, you're not doing any bulk boiling if your liquid is subcooled. On the other hand, uh, if, if your liquid uh, temperature, your bulk liquid temperature at the beginning of your vent process is at or above the saturation temperature at that final pressure, you're going to have bulk boiling in that liquid and you're going to lose a lot of, more of uh, mass of vapor, I'm sorry, mass of your propellant as it vaporizes through, through bulk boiling. And then that is uh, subject to being vented out the tank. So, so you've got to treat the, uh, the venting process differently depending on whether the uh, liquid is subcooled or not relative to the final pressure. And if it's at a, at a temperature where uh, you're going to hit saturation as you go through that depressurization process, then you've got to uh, ideally break it up into both the subcooled part of it and the saturated uh, venting part of it to figure out how much vented mass you really lose. So uh, let me just throw a few equations again. These are pretty straightforward equations to figure out the initial uh, mass of the liquid as shown in 4.1 there, uh, the initial mass of the gas, 4.2. Again, uh, nothing uh, uh, terribly fancy about this. It's tank volume, the uh, density of the gas, and the fill level. Uh, are the variables you need to do that. So I mentioned um, subcold or saturation. I already talked a little about that. So let me jump down to the equations right here. Uh, if you're venting subcold liquid uh, and you assume that you are not losing uh, uh, your, or that is you're not vaporizing uh, significant amounts of uh, liquid because you're in a subcold condition, uh, you can basically uh, just calculate what the final uh, mass of the um, uh, fluid is at the, fi at the final condition to figure out how much uh, ullage got uh, vented. Uh, now, the one thing you don't uh, know um, uh, is the, pre um, generally, is the temperature of that ullage gas at that final condition. So there's a few uh, bounding cases you can put in place. Um, one of them is an isothermal expansion where um, uh, you assume that the uh, uh, gas te temperature stays the same as, as it did in the initial condition. Uh, this would uh, kind of uh, physically would be uh, something akin to um, a warm tank wall that transfers heat fast enough to keep the ullage at that temperature. Not uh, uh, generally a, a very realistic bounding case, but in, in some conditions it, it may make sense to use that. 
Uh, the other uh, bounding case is a, a saturated uh, condition where you assume that at the end of your venting process, uh, your OLEDGE gas is at a saturation temperature. Um, this one, it might be a, a valid if you've got very high fill levels or at least be close or in terms of a bounding case if you're, if you're in high fill levels and you can assume that, you know, that OLEDGE base gets swept out uh, pretty well by the venting process and, and you're pretty close to saturation. Uh, one that I think is, is probably m more realistic for a bounding case, and again, you can set these up different different ways and run all the calculations and see see what kind of a, a band of, um, um, uh, of uh, temperatures you get. But an adiabatic uh, polytropic expansion process, uh, so adiabatic, um, of course, implying there's no heat transfer uh, to the walls during the process. Uh, well, you can use equation 4.4 to come up with an estimate of what that gas temperature is, uh, the final gas temperature in the ullage. Um, and based on that, then, then you, you've got, uh, you can come up with the properties, the density of the gas in the final condition. You take the mass at the after venting minus the mass, of course, before venting, and you come up with a, a mass of vented gas. So that's the simplest case where you've got some cold liquid. Uh, the next uh, uh, case that, that can be handled with closed form solution is if you're uh, venting saturated liquid at a constant pressure. Uh, this is what they did on that uh, uh, AO, uh, A203, uh, the Saturn 4B test I mentioned earlier. Uh, they, and I'll show a little bit more about that. They actually used repulsive settling and they kept the tank at a constant back pressure uh, and it was saturated so that. Uh, it was uh, predictable how much uh, vented gas was coming out. Uh, in that case, uh, you can uh, use the amount of heat coming into the liquid divided by the latent heat of vaporization uh, times the uh, time, the, the venting time, and you can come up with a, a amount of vented gas. Um, the more difficult one is where the uh, pressure is changing, and, and in that case, you, you don't have any choice that I'm aware of other than going to a more uh, higher fidelity uh, time stepping uh, algorithm of some type or high fidelity uh, uh, CFD or, or uh, finite difference or finite element type of a, a analytical process or numerical simulation. Um, a few venting considerations. Uh, I won't go into these in detail, but you can read through them on your own. Um, uh, these all affect uh, how much is lost. Uh, initial OH temperature, uh, initial liquid temperatures we mentioned, subcold or not, final tank pressure, of course, and, uh, and then uh, whether the OH is a single species OH, that is it's a vapor and it's propellant uh, uh, in, in the tank or whether you've got a non-condensable gas uh, in there. Uh, all of those have impacts uh, on how much gets vented uh, in various ways. Uh, and then finally, environmental heating. Um, sometimes if uh, the vent process is short enough and the environmental heating is not, uh, not, is not very high, you can neglect it for a first order approximation, but other times you have to include it. Um, so in terms of what you can usefully do with that vented gas, uh, if you do have to vent, or if you design design your system such that you're going to vent at some point uh, in your emission segments, uh, as you can use it for settling if you're in a low Earth orbit or, excuse me, some other low gravity environment. And as I mentioned, yeah, AS203 uh, flight experiment did, did exactly that. Again, I won't get into the details with this. You can read about it if you'd like. But uh, here's a quick schematic of what they had. They had a liquid hydrogen tank with them. Um, they, they split it up into a non-propulsive uh, vent system and then propul uh, propulsive uh, vent flow as well. Uh, and a little bit of a schematic of the hardware. I think this is uh, very helpful to look back on because they have a lot of good uh, information about how the system worked um, and what did and didn't work well and how, how they might change it if they were to do it again. So again, uh, for sake of time, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on here is the equations that uh, they, they developed to uh, look at the performance of that system. Uh, one thing that's kind of interesting, they, they plotted uh, the ullage heat flux and this shaded region is kind of what they experienced actually in flight during the Apollo missions. And then use the, um, uh, the amount of uh, liquid heat flux, remember this is a saturated tank, uh, to figure out uh, how much thrust they could get out of that system. And then over here they plotted uh, uh, the actual data that they got on several of the Apollo missions versus uh, what they had predicted. Uh, and they were within the band uh, uh, pretty pretty well uh, with that. So 
again, some information um, that they include in the reports that I have uh, footnoted here and then the reference section later. So um, if you were wanted to do that with, an, with an, a new system or a system under development, you could look at some basic thrust equations and get a, an idea of, of what kind of cold gas thrust you could get out of a vented gas. So that's what these next set of equations uh, provide as, as, a, as a method to do that quickly. Closed form again, which is the uh, uh, most of this report is trying to you know uh, find uh, you know high level system level order magnitude, but, but quickly uh, run quick calculations that you don't have to uh, program in. Uh, so this is the uh, equation for thrust force based on the exit velocity uh, of a thruster. Um, this is the equation for the uh, uh, exit velocity of a, of a nozzle. Now, uh, and then uh, equivalent uh, formulation of that. Uh, one way to simplify this, if, if you look at uh, the maximum um, exit velocity, if, if it's exhausting to uh, vacuum, which would be the case if we were going to use this uh, for um, thrust set settling or pro propellant settling, uh, you can use this equation to find the maximum velocity. And when you do that, that, that simplifies all the above equations to the point where you can do hand calculations with it. Uh, and there's a description of what T sub zero stands for. Um, or, or how to calculate it. Uh, you can also uh, calculate specific impulse with equation 410. And um, I have an uh, example uh, problem here further down uh, where, where some of these are exercised to show uh, what kind of thrust uh, levels you can get for, for various vent, vent flows. Again, for sake of time, uh, I'll keep moving on with that. So that's one way to use uh, vented uh, uh, flow um, advantageously on your vehicle. Uh, the other one is with cooling capacity. So if you've if you're venting the gas uh, at a relatively cool temperature, there's an opportunity to uh, to uh, use uh, either a simplified heat exchanger that might be a tubing you know wrapped around something or something more advanced to uh, provide cooling uh, to various components. So um, you know the simplest uh, uh, expression of that for cooling capacity is, uh, you know, the enthalpy, the change in enthalpy, enthalpy times the uh, mass flow. Your vent mass flow will tell you what your uh, maximum cool, cooling capacity is. <clears throat> and, uh, of course, <clears throat> your actual enthalpy coming out and, and it depends on your effectiveness of your heat exchanger. So, uh, as with most of these, this is just going to get you a first order look at it. And, again, an uh, example problem coming up on that. Uh, I had mentioned the uh, liquid level rise uh, issue. So um, this is probably one, uh, again, for time, don't want to dig too far into, but the idea is that um, uh, in, under low gravity conditions, your buoyancy forces are much less. So when you have bulk boiling, uh, the residence time of those bubbles uh, that are formed uh, is a lot longer. It takes a lot more time for them to reach the interface and then eventually into the ullage. Uh, so you have a potential, depending on uh, various parameters, which I'll discuss here, uh, to entrain a lot of that uh, vaporized uh, uh, vapor in the liquid, uh, such that you know the whole liquid vapor mixture starts to rise up in the tank. And if that vent's open, you could lose a lot of liquid. So there are several um, models that were created during the Apollo era that uh, lend themselves to um, reasonably uh, straightforward uh, analysis. Uh, not close form, um, so they do take some uh, numerical. Uh, let me just get down to one of the equations. Some numerical uh, calculations, but uh, not as advanced as, as uh, CFD work. Uh, so uh, again, for time, I'll just jump down to some of the exam or some of the plots here. This was uh, uh, using uh, the bulk boiling uh, model that was created during that time frame. Uh, to figure out what's the maximum pressure, uh, vent pressure, uh, I'm sorry, depressurization. So total pressure from uh, locked up tank to the end of the pressurization. Uh, uh, you can have versus uh, the change in height. So relative change in the liquid height for various uh, entrained ratios. So beta of one would be all of the, all of the bulk boiling would be remain retained in the liquid. Uh, point two would be 20% of it by, by mass, I believe, for this model. So uh, that helps to do some, um, and again, I apologize for going through this quickly, but I, I want to make sure we end up on time here. Um, 
take this plot along with, with this, this one for bulk boiling. And it, these are just uh, plots based on the equations I'm showing up here for, for hydrogen. So they can be applied to other, other propellants as well. Uh, they give you a sense of, uh, are you in a region uh, with your event process where you've got to worry about liquid rise or not? Uh, beyond that, uh, you've got to uh, get a little more uh, detailed. Uh, and the, their second model was a, a vapor boundary layer model. And I'll show the uh, kind of the schematic of that. So the idea was that um, you, you form vapor bubbles, uh, they assumed on the walls of the container. Uh, the liquid is saturated, of course. Uh, and you get some equivalent vapor thickness here. And based on that, uh, they, ca they were able to do a time stepping routine that allowed them to uh, come up with um, uh, what that uh, liquid rise level is and how much gets entrained and so forth. So again, some of the same kind of plots. Uh, this time, because uh, you you're actually um, uh, doing a more uh, informed, I guess, uh, model where you're taking into account acceleration level and vent flow, flow rates, um, those par uh, parameters have an effect on uh, that dimensionless liquid rise. So uh, this delta H over H, H0 is the original height of the liquid, and then, and then delta H, of course, is the change in height. So um, as you vent, as you might expect, uh, the faster you vent, uh, the higher that liquid rise can, can reach because you know, you're venting fast enough that um, uh, you're entraining more uh, vapor in that liquid. Uh, and again, here's a similar uh, plot they did of uh, uh, the effect of uh, G level, they called it, or acceleration environment on, the, on that uh, uh, liquid rise. Uh, so that was kind of a fast tour through there, but I think some of these examples for venting are, are more helpful. Um, and again, this is an example of saturated uh, venting of oxygen, three bar, uh, sitting at three bar. Uh, how much, uh, uh, in this case, I, I believe the, yeah, the liquid is all subcooled, so you, you can calculate how much uh, you lose in terms of mass. Um, this is using that uh, AD, or isentropic um, uh, expansion uh, uh, equation I showed to come up with a final estimate of the ollage temperature. So this is the initial ollage uh, mass. This is the final ollage uh, estimated temperature. And then with that, you can come up with a final uh, ollage mass. And the difference between those two, the initial and the final, of course, is how much you ended up venting. Again, this is for a subcooled case. So uh, if your liquid is not subcooled, uh, you're going to uh, have to use uh, uh, saturated uh, venting equation or numerical approach. Uh, these are some of the uh, equations to look at propulsive settling uh, or an example of it. Um, in this case, uh, here's that uh, maximum uh, velocity exit based on the parameters uh, in this example problem. So you can come up with a, uh, the velocity, you can come up with a thrust force. Again, these are all closed forms uh, uh, equations and these are ideal as well. So and then an ideal specific impulse. And based on that, if you know what the um, uh, what the vehicle mass is, you can you can figure out uh, what kind of um, uh, settling uh, acceleration you're able to create with that with that ideal thrust. So again, this would be a, a way to quickly determine whether uh, there's any advantage uh, to using the vent for that purpose if you chose to. Uh, now the interesting thing is, um, uh, I think the second part of the question was if you uh, use some of that cooling event co uh, to venting gas to cool uh, components of the spacecraft before you did the uh, uh, went uh, put it through a cold gas thruster, uh, what effect does that have? And um, bottom line, uh, let's see. it uh, is it warms up. Uh, you actually get better performance out of it. I'm not finding right now the uh, comparison I'm making here with the, uh, the wording, but if you read through this, um, you'll see that the, um, the warmer the gas, uh, the higher the velocity coming out of the uh, nozzle exit. So you actually get an improvement in, in propulsion if you use it for cooling first. And then the final <clears throat> example I give, and again, this one, uh, there's no closed form uh, solutions for, so I gave some examples for, uh, for this particular uh, case of the bulk boiling, um, you, uh, incorporating those equations to come up with what kind of relative liquid rise you get for uh, various assumed uh, uh, trained ratios, and then uh, 
uh, delta P, what's the maximum uh, uh, delta P for that. And then finally, um, uh, a time stepping algorithm looking at <clears throat> uh, what the effect of first acceleration level is. So as you might expect, here's a couple of different um, starting uh, fill levels just to explain what these plots are showing. So first starting of event at uh, looks like 85% uh, here. If you're at one to the uh, e to the minus three g, um, you can uh, vent based on this model and the parameters that were put in uh, input to it. It'll rise some, but it won't get up to the to the top of the tank. However, just dropping it down by an order of magnitude in terms of acceleration level, you you uh, exceed uh, the tank height, so you're actually starting to vent liquid in this case. And then a uh, similar comparison of fifty percent. Uh, and this final uh, <clears throat> plot here for this example shows the uh, effect of uh, vent rate. So again, as you'd expect, uh, lower vent rate, uh, this one's starting at 90% fill level, uh, just barely keeps from hitting the top of the tank, uh, according to this boundary layer model. Uh, if you vent faster, though, you exceed it. So, so these are the kinds of um, uh, plots that you, you could use to begin to zero in on your uh, operational scheme for um, preventing uh, under low gravity conditions so that you don't vent any liquid uh, during that process. Uh, and just a summary of uh, what are the uh, parameters that affect, uh, affect that liquid rise. So uh, at, at the end of those example, example problems. So in this next section, uh, pressurization, um, first, I'm going to um, touch a little bit on active pressurization. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, some data that's uh, available experimentally from interfacial heat mass transfer, but this is really the key uh, uh, that takes usually higher fidelity uh, modeling to understand what exactly is happening and whether you've got net evaporation or condensation in, during an active pressurization process. Uh, and then a little bit about self pressurization, which is also very very difficult, if not impossible, to find closed form solutions that give you the adequate answer for. <clears throat> and then <clears throat> a little bit about, although it's not pressurization, it has to do with uh, controlling the pressure in the tank uh, when it comes to um, uh, ollage collapse or the, or the uh, reduction of the tank pressure, both intentionally and unintentionally. So um, on the active uh, pressurization side, um, just as an example, some combinations of um, pressure and propellant uh, that have been shown to be workable and, and, a, and a few that aren't, I think I have uh, in here too, but uh, uh, helium can be used as a non-condensable pressure for uh, any of the ones we've been looking at, hydrogen, methane, or oxygen. Hydrogen it can be a non-condensable for liquid methane, it's been tested. Uh, nitrogen uh, is a partially condensable pressure for liquid oxygen. Um, uh, gaseous phase, of course, of any cryogen is, is a condensable pressure for its liquid phase. So it's going to condense more, but uh, but the advantage there is you can uh, do autog what's called autogenous pressurization, where you're tapping off your liquid supply, uh, vaporizing it in, in, in some uh, uh, type of subsystem that's usually warming it up uh, as well, and then uh, using that as pressure in gas. So you don't have to carry separate pressure in bottles, or at least reduce the number of uh, separate stored pressure in bottles you have. Uh, and then there are a few uh, uh, pressure mixtures that have been uh, developed. Um, and I tried dine is one of the ones I give as an example down here. So um, <clears throat> there's a lower bound pressurization, active pressurization uh, uh, calculation you can do <clears throat> as shown in uh, 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 equation 5.1 here. Uh, and it's just based on the um, initial and ending fill fractions, uh, F1 and F2. Uh, and then the densities uh, evaluated under different, various conditions are shown here. And it's assuming a, um, an isentropic um, uh, compression uh, for, for, uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the pressurization. And actually this is sufficient for expulsion, you can use for expulsion too. So the final fill fraction could be whatever amount of uh, liquid was sent uh, to the engine or where, where have you in the expulsion process. Uh, so this gives you a lower bound. Now, um, typically, um, if this is used, uh, a collapse factor is often applied to it based on either experimental or flight data or both. And that takes into account um, um, the actual 
uh, pressure mass uh, that has been found uh, to be used uh, that accounts for the, uh, the, the the bad assumption basically of an adiabatic uh, pressurization. So you you have cooling of that pressure gas as it comes in and uh, cools because of the, uh, the depending on the temperatures of the tank walls and, and definitely at the interface of the liquid and then also some condensation potentially in that condensation or evaporation. So the uh, variance from the you know, the ideal pressure at mass is is what's taken into account with that collapse factor. But you can come up with this uh, lower bound ideal pressure and mass with closed uh, form solution. Um, upper bound pressurization cases uh, uh, harder to uh, harder to define appropriately. Um, you can uh, in the same reference that I give here that that uh, provides the uh, ideal pressurization lower bound. Uh, uh, also um, describes how you can come up with an equilibrium case uh, that where you assume that the, the vapor and the liquid uh, are all, and if there's an incompressible um, pressure in that gas as well, are all in uh, thermal equilibrium during the entire process. But uh, that's highly unrealistic for most uh, conditions unless you, you're doing basically a full drain of the tank so that you only have a little bit of residuals left and they could potentially be at equilibrium. Otherwise, you're probably going to be subcooled. So not ter of terribly much use for um, uh, condensables uh, pressurants, but for incondensable, and I'll show down below, or non condensable pressurant, uh, you can come up with an upper bound. Um, and it's uh, the same equation that you can use for a partially condensable pressure requirement uh, that I'm going to show further down. Uh, partially condensable pressurants aren't common, but you can use nitrogen and oxygen, and you will have some uh, some um, con condensate of nitrogen that forms. Uh, whether that's a problem or not depends on you know uh, what your criteria is for for your oxygen tank and how much contamination with nitrogen you can you can maintain. Uh, you can use uh, Rolts and uh, Dalton's law to come up with a, an equilibrium um, condition for non, uh, I'm sorry, for a, for a partially condensable pressure. But again, similar to the previous case, this is uh, high, highly re unrealistic in most cases because you're not in equilibrium in the liquid and, and gas phases uh, in terms of partial pressure uh, and um, molar fraction unless you've got very low uh, very low uh, residuals left in the tank very low fill level but you can come up with a lower bound uh, and it's basically the equation shown here um, a lower bound of uh, uh, partially condensable uh, pressure and it can be uh, uh, calculated based on the um, uh, density of that pressure and times the volume of the all edge and then uh, that, that density is based on um, uh, you know you have a pressure in the tank and the saturation, uh, partial pressure, the vapor, uh, the difference between those two then gives you the uh, uh, the amount of uh, partially condensable that's left uh, minimum. Uh, now that you can also use that for a uh, non-condensable pressure and mass as the maximum because the non-condensable won't condense. So now you've got the maximum amount and you've got tank totally cooled down. Um, that's probably a lot of uh, words to throw into one sentence, but uh, if you read through this, um, uh, hopefully it becomes a little clearer how, how you could use those. And uh, again, there's example problems coming up. Uh, interfacial heat mass transfer, as I mentioned, very difficult to uh, uh, to find closed form solutions that are adequate. Uh, these are a few of the approaches uh, that have been done over the past. Uh, I won't go into details with those. Um, but um, just as an example of, of, of one that's been used in some of the legacy codes for NASA, um, just as an example, this is showing a heat transfer coefficient for uh, hydrogen liquid interface during pressurization, and it defines uh, a um, temperature at the thermal boundary. So it isn't the bulk temperature, the ohlage, um, and you can come up with a Neusselt number and so forth. and, and, and uh, that uh, temperature, thermal boundary temperature, is uh, is found by assuming uh, adiabatic compression during the pressurization process. So, um, I wouldn't recommend using this necessarily. It's just more of a uh, getting a better intuitive understanding of um, of uh, you know what what you could do if you had the appropriate empirical or flight data. Uh, but again, in most cases, you're going to have to use a higher fidelity model to to uh, get an estimate of that uh, interface uh, heat and mass transfer.
Uh, Self-pressurization, uh, probably can move through this pretty quickly. Once again, very difficult to come up with a closed form solutions. Uh, there's a lot going on during self-pressurization in a tank. Uh, I have a uh, CFD model that probably will show this better than me trying to talk through it. Uh, this was a, um, I think this was done by Motor and Barcy. Oh, uh, oh, Mokasimi and, 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 and Steve Barcy. Um, uh, this was a, a CFD modeling of this earlier. I, I mentioned there was a test done with this tank um, in a vacuum chamber with MLI. Um, this was a self-pressurization test, and they did a CFD comparison <clears throat> looking at it. But, but what's interesting to note here, it, it kind of gives you a little bit of a sense of what's happening when, when you've got a self-pressurization. You've got heat coming into the sidewalls of the tank, and that sets up a, a, a convective flow here uh, as the as the uh, liquid in this case near the wall is warmed up and and and, uh, and, and rises and then the cold uh, liquid comes in to take its place and the temperature interface so this side is uh, is uh, flow vectors uh, on this side is temperature gradients as I mentioned uh, I think earlier you always have saturation at that interface but then you usually have a if a subcooled liquid at the bottom you have a, a thermal gradient uh, to till you get to that subcooled bulk temperature so over time, self-pressurization is all of these things happening in tandem. You've got uh, slowly warming a subcooled liquid, uh, and until it reaches saturation temperature, uh, then you start getting more boil off. Until then, it's less. Uh, you've got flow that's going on in the liquid based on the uh, heat flux that's coming into the sidewall. And then, of course, all of the you know the same sorts of flow patterns or similar flow patterns are happening in the ology as well. So uh, it's a complex problem. Uh, they were able to match pretty closely the test data with their CFD. <clears throat> and this is another example. In this case, this is uh, methane uh, modeled. Um, I think this was the one by uh, Motor that I was thinking of. Oh, yeah, Motor and Bose in it too, Kasemi and, uh, and Steve Barcy again. Um, showing a little bit uh, higher fill level with methane, but again, the same sorts of um, uh, ther thermodynamics and fluid flows and heat transfer going on. You've got a, a temperature gradient with inter interface at saturation going down to the cooler regions, and then these flows getting set up based on the, the heat flux coming in. So uh, based on these models, and then I think after they hit steady state conditions, after some period of time, they were able to go to a nodal, um, uh, 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 nodal type uh, lump node uh, simulation that, that was faster to implement to find out uh, this was many days and storage on the moon uh, type of a simulation uh, to look at the temperature rise. But uh, you're kind of, um, to my knowledge, uh, stuck with kind of going with these higher fidelity uh, models to really get a good uh, sense of what's going on with self-pressurization. Uh, ollage collapse um, in some ways falls in the same category, category, but let's describe a little bit what ollage collapse is. So uh, originally it, it was defined as when the tank pressure uh, <clears throat> reduces so quickly due to condensation that's occurring usually at the liquid gas interface, although it could be at the tank walls as well, uh, is, is so quick that you actually have uh, can measure as a measurable velocity uh, in the um, in the in the ollage towards the interface, so a so-called collapse of the of the ollage. <clears throat> uh, it's as you imagine uh, problematic when it happens unintentionally because you know, if it's during an engine feed, uh, obviously that's a problem or any other type of uh, liquid expulsion uh, that's occurring. But it can also be a problem even in a static tank if it's going to drop below uh, uh, desired temperature or I'm sorry desired pressures in the tank. And, and potentially cause a, um, a structural issue. So um, uh, there's been some sloshing tests, not a lot that have been done uh, in closed tanks uh, to take a look at uh, the effect of uh, slosh on that ullage collapse uh, phenomenon. And, and what's basically happening with the slosh, as I pointed out earlier with the subcooling, if you've got subcooled bulk liquid at the bottom of a tank and you begin sloshing it, that, that cold liquid starts to circulate towards the interface and it immediately brings down the tank pressure to uh, saturation pressure that's associated with that, with that cold or fluid. So um, uh, that's the essence. And then if it's a bare tank wall, it's the same sort of process, only instead of uh, uh, circulating cold fluid, you may be uncovering cold parts of the tank wall, let's say during an expulsion process uh, that now suddenly, uh, or perhaps during a, um, 
a maneuver where a coal tank wall that was covered in liquid uh, during a vehicle maneuver is now uncovered and suddenly the haulage gas is uh, in contact with it. You can have a quick pressure drop. Uh, there's uh, uh, an analytical approach. Oh, let me first show you some test data just to show you how much this uh, uh, this phenomenon can, can affect uh, the tank pressure. Uh, this is a um, liquid hydrogen sloshing test started out uh, at about um, uh, one atmosphere, uh, roughly. Uh, the ramp period is where pressure pressure was put in. I think this was an all hydrogen pressure, and it probably says over here. Yeah, hydrogen pressure. So it's an, a no incondensable pressure it's in this test. And then a whole period where enough pressure was kept in place just to allow steady, you know, steady state pressure to uh, tank to be at a uh, quasi steady condition and then sloshing began and you can see in this case the pressure dropped not all the way back down to uh, saturation of one atmosphere but, but pretty close um, and that's uh, kind of common if you if you are able to uh, or have a slosh condition that's uh, close enough to the resonance of the tank and in this case um, you know it's a little under one hertz and 1.5 inches plus or minus in both direction. Uh, now, if, if that sloshing is less severe or not near residence, you can, and I'll show a little, some quick examples here, uh, the pressure drop can be much more gradual or, or, or shallow. So uh, there's, a lot, uh, there's a lot going on there that, that you have to look at if, you, if you're trying to analyze this problem. And here's the temp uh, for some of the temperature uh, profiles before, during, and, and after the slosh. It basically brings things down to saturation pretty quickly. So uh, there's been some uh, slosh regimes defined. Um, you can be in a planar region on either side uh, on this plot um, uh, where you've got small enough waves. Uh, the thermodynamic response is not, is not very severe. You don't have that much of a pressure drop. However, if you're in this, what, what's called in this mapping, uh, chaotic waves um, in kind of that resonance region, uh, you get larger waves and that's when you start to get that circulation of the subcooled liquid towards the interface and, the, and the potentially uh, a large pressure drop. A uh, swirling wave uh, uh, regime happens when you start to get kind of a, just exactly as it, it sounds, a, a wave that's kind of uh, uh, circling around the tank. Um, uh, and it's somewhere in between in terms of its response uh, thermodynamically. So there's a paper here. Uh, I have the, uh, it's not Miles, I have it in a different footnote uh, that has looked at some of the test data that's available for sloshing with uh, hydrogen, nitrogen, and I think, uh, oh, HFE 7000, uh, a fluid, a simulant fluid. Um, and they were able to define a sloshing Nussle number and a sloshing Reynolds number um, that uh, correlates very well to these uh, to these um, sloshing experiments that have been run. Some of them run by the authors of the paper, and then others that uh, have been run elsewhere. Uh, a couple of them by us at NASA. So, um, and then this is uh, using the techniques of that paper, and I've got some of the governing equations, and I would refer folks that want to try try to use this uh, to the to the footnotes uh, where it has a paper reference. But uh, they were able to uh, characterize the uh, the pressure drop fairly well. The the uh, uh, experimental were with the uh, triangles, and then the uh, simulation was um, was with the uh, I'm sorry, backwards. The uh, simulation over the triangles and the experimental data is with the solid line. Uh, so uh, one of the things they mentioned in the report is they do a pretty good job of being able to predict this slope, uh, but not necessarily where that pressure depressurization stops or where that alleged collapse stops. So uh, again, another one of these cases where you're probably going to be forced to go with a higher fidelity model, but uh, this uh, this approach may give you a sense of whether you've got an issue uh, in terms of uh, pressure, quick pressure drop in your tank for certain uh, sloshing uh, type situations. Um, this is a little bit of a conversation about how you could apply that previous um, uh, approach to uh, an expulsion process if you were during engine feed and wanted to look at sloshing and uh, see what what kind of a pressure drop uh, you might get. Uh, Tank wall effect, I don't think I'll talk too much about this. You can, you can read it if you've got a common bulkhead, of course. Uh, that's, that's a potential source of that cold uh, surface that, that can cause a, uh, a knowledge collapse as well or, or a pressure drop at least of some type. Uh, 
uh, subcooled liquid injection, uh, similar to the sloshing, only instead of being induced by slosh, it, it could be induced by uh, 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 injection of liquid into the tank uh, that uh, breaks through to the interface and is subcooled relative to the pressure uh, in, in the tank. So you can get a, a drop there too. So um, here's some of those uh, pressure, uh, pressurization example uh, calculations. Uh, autogenous, this is the ideal autogenous uh, pressurization. Again, these equations could be used for non-condensables as well. This was a, and in fact, I think I compared in this one to, uh, oh, in the next one. Yeah, so uh, example 5.1 is with uh, autogenous pressurization. 5.2 is using a non-condensable, so like helium. Uh, how much of a difference would there be? Uh, in this case, the ideal difference is like 91 kilograms of helium versus 732 for oxygen to get the same uh, performance. So um, those are the kind of trades that you, you often see in vehicles. And do you want to carry uh, pressurized helium bottles because you use less pressure, or do you want to use autogenous because you don't have to carry as many pressure bottles? And the performance, of course, of the con non-condensable pressure is going to use up less mass. Uh, so there's a trade uh, in terms of overall system mass for, for both situations. Uh, there's a little bit about self-pressurization knowledge collapse. Again, more of a, a discussion of what are the parameters that affect it and so forth. So let me do a quick time check. We've got uh, about 15 minutes left. <laughs> uh, for folks that are still hanging in there, uh, let me uh, let me touch briefly on a few other topics uh, that kind of didn't fall into these other categories. Uh, and I'll, I will be very brief with them and I'll probably leave off the calculation examples for uh, folks to look at after the fact with the online, um, the online version of this. Uh, so chill down, tank filling, very important. Uh, uh, any, any piping or tank uh, that you're going to fill with a cryogen, you've got to chill it down first. Uh, and both the, uh, method and and the uh, how fast you chill down has to, has to be uh, has to be managed. So this is an example. I won't go into detail of a, of a non-vented fill of a tank that was pre-chilled to a certain target level, and then um, using a uh, an ingestion technique is shown here, where the fluid was uh, pushed towards the interface to help. Uh, induce condensation to keep that pressure down so you didn't have to vent the tank during filling. This was over 90% uh, fill level, uh, which is possible uh, by, by doing that. So this is a case where that condensation in the interface is intentional and is helping the situation. You're actually keeping that pressure down that would normally be rising and you have to vent the tank. Um, uh, but in this case, uh, as, as opposed to sloshing and haulage collapse, we're, we're, we're using it to our benefit. Uh, this is a few things out of Flynn's book uh, in terms of guidelines um, uh, as far as minimum and maximum uh, chill down flow rates. If, if you chill down, uh, let's say, piping uh, too quickly with too much flow rate, you can induce uh, unwanted thermal stresses, uh, particularly with thick flanges and, and thick uh, other thick structures uh, that are going to see a, a very large temperature gradient across them if you're putting too much uh, chill down flow through them. So that's what this uh, plot on the right hand side provides for a few different, a uh, couple of different materials and then with uh, liquid hydrogen. And then on the left hand side is um, an example and you can do these with hand calculations as well. But um, I think these are nice, uh, quick, intuitive plots that are in Flynn's book. Um, this is kind of a, a minimum uh, f flow so that you don't uh, uh, get basically vapor lock. If you go too slow in your uh, chill down process, you just create a lot of vapor and say in your piping system and, and pretty soon your pressure differential to, to push the cryogen flu uh, cryogen through uh, drops uh, to zero and you, and you don't have no more flow. Uh, now you can you can calculate your chill down uh, mass, the maximum amount that you're going to end up vaporizing in the, in the chill down process, which is, uh, as you'd imagine, uh, very important for many operations. Uh, and certainly you know, in a vehicle, if you're chilling down the engines before you, before you start them, uh, the maximum amount is going to be uh, the mass of whatever wall you're cooling, so the, the participating mass of, of whatever that structure is, um, divided by the latent heat of uh, vaporization of, of the propellant that you're chilling with, uh, times that uh, specific heat integral that we talked about earlier. So that's going to give you the maximum amount. 
Now, uh, the minimum amount is going to be if you, in addition to this uh, cooling effect you get from uh, vaporizing from liquid to uh, to gas in this chill down process, uh, if you also take out some of the sensible cooling capacity of that uh, uh, of the fluid that you're using to chill down. So, in other words, once it turns to vapor, it then warms up some, and that's more cooling that you have available. Uh, you can use this equation, and that'll give you the minimum if uh, T final is the target temperature that you're chilling down to. Uh, a few comments about some tank internal structures. Uh, I mentioned that internal foam has been used in the past. It's got some advantages uh, and some disadvantages, and I think they're about evenly mixed in these bullets here. So uh, one of the, um, uh, this is actually the second stage, I believe, yeah, uh, of the Saturn 4B, uh, which also used internal insulation. Remember the third stage did as well. Um, the Arian uh, 5, um, I forget what the ME stands for, but it's a next evolution, um, is actually, uh, there's a paper out publicly available that shows uh, some of the internal insulation they're considering for that uh, common bulkhead and a little bit past that interface uh, for the, uh, their liquid hydrogen and LOX uh, uh, to storage for, for that uh, upper stage uh, vehicle. So, uh, so it's still in play in some designs. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, in this case, they're using kind of a structure to hold that foam in place uh, to avoid any um, uh, debris uh, coming off of the foam. And of course, there's a lot of tests they've done on uh, uh, the uh, physical properties of the foam uh, under various conditions uh, to ensure that it, it's going to work the way they want it to. Um, I don't think it's been uh, flown yet. I think it's still under test. <clears throat> um, Foam on a, a common bulkhead, actually the, the whole topic of a common bulkhead from in terms of insulation is an interesting one and, and one we don't have a lot of time to discuss, but uh, but when you have two, uh, let's just take a look at the one we just saw, the liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen together. Obviously, uh, these are very different temperatures, liquid hydrogen being much colder. So you've got to have some type of insulation here as they're doing with, it, with this, uh, this configuration that uh, mitigates the oxygen seeing temperatures cold enough across this wall that it can either begin to uh, collapse uh, the pressure if the ollage is up against this wall or uh, potentially freeze if, if the liquid is. So those are two examples of things that you've got to mitigate with a common bulkhead uh, by some means. Uh, uh, either convince yourself that a bare, bare tank wall is, is sufficient for your operational uh, conditions or put some type of insulation in there. Uh, uh, and there's a little more conversation about that uh, in, in the report here. Uh, baffles, another fascinating topic that I don't have uh, a lot of time to discuss today and not, not a lot in here other than to try and point you in some directions that you might uh, be interested in if you're looking into these. Again, closed form solutions, hard to, hard to find that, are, that you can rely on for baffles. Uh, usually need to, to do some more in-depth uh, analysis, but uh, these are some of the types of baffles that are commonly used to control the liquid during various operations and um, uh, different uh, maneuvers that a vehicle may go through. Uh, liquid acquisition devices, again, another topic with lots of data on that um, uh, I'm just touching on here just, just to make sure uh, uh, that folks are aware that there's information out there in terms of uh, for low, low gravity environments, low acceleration environments, uh, you can use LADS to uh, either partial or, or, or fully communicating LADS to position the liquid and keep it in position during, uh, during outflow. Uh, and the trade then becomes um, uh, the mass of that LAD system uh, and its operation uh, uh, versus uh, propulsive settling, for example. And there, it's not a either or necessarily, uh, it could be a combination of both. Uh, you could have a LAD that just reduces your your acceleration level that you have to maintain to, to get, to, to get uh, constant engine feed. So uh, there's some trades there. Uh, and I think, uh, yeah, this is one of the final sections. Um, uh, a few things about external structures that, that can help you with your uh, CFM uh, uh, system. Uh, thermal radiation shielding, um, you can put a thermal radiation shield externally. Um, here's some of the things you have to think about if you're going to do that, you know, installation, stowage, deployment, if it's got to be deployed, what interference it might have with other structures and so forth. But 
Uh, you can buy a lot with a thermal radiation shield, particularly if you've got a solar uh, solar influx uh, coming in uh, in a place where it's going to either directly impact the side wall of your tank or is going to get into your tank uh, at a significant amount of heat flux. So uh, there's a few equations here about radiation shields. This is the generalized equation. Of course, the uh, complication comes in defining these resistances as you start to add shields. But I give some equations here for simple uh, two gray bodies, uh, for example, or between two gray bodies and then uh, with one shield in place. And even this equation with uh, one shield in place is kind of a nice, again, rough order magnitude uh, look at what, what a shield will help you with for a variety of cases. Uh, and then I, I come up with a few cases uh, that are common in terms of where you might use a shield uh, either internally in a vehicle between two tanks or uh, externally. Uh, it's a sun shield uh, and so forth, and how you might use this equation and the other ones that are shown. Um, vapor cooled shields. Um, this is kind of a uh, can, is related to the to the vent uh, the vent discussion, but uh, you can uh, design a vapor cooled shield that will uh, intercept uh, some or most of the heat that's coming into a uh, cryogen tank from an external environmental heat load. Um, and there's uh, some information here about this. Uh, Flynn has a good chapter on it. This is an excerpt from his book about some of the features of vapor-cooled shields. Uh, they're used a lot in uh, helium systems, actually, but uh, but they can be used. Uh, and you can also um, use uh, warmer cryogen uh, uh, barriers of various types with your design to uh, protect the lower uh, temperature of cryogen. It's not really a vapor-cooled shield, but it's using the same idea. Uh, multifunctional structure, I don't think I'll say a lot about other than uh, it's always good to think about is there more than one function uh, that you can use uh, for any does a vehicle design. Uh, and it, it, it comes into play with your cryogenic systems when you're trying to shield it. Uh, can use that shield, uh, for example, uh, if it's sun facing with photovoltaic cells for power or uh, can use it as a radiator uh, if you're looking at deep space, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, Engine thermal soap back in another area that uh, there's not a lot of closed form solutions for, but it's something you've got to keep in mind after an engine burn. Uh, you've got a lot of energy stored in the engine. And let me show a figure that probably is easier to look at with this. Let me zoom out a little bit. This is a published paper. I think it was a, a thesis uh, study, um, but it's it's indicative, I think, of, of, of the general issue of uh, soak back from engine after engine burns. Uh, it starts off at time zero, you know, roughly around room temperature. I think it's this dark uh, blue line. Uh, and these roughly line up to the, I tried to line the geometry of this nozzle up roughly to the plot. So uh, as you, as the engine uh, is burnt uh, or engine burns, combusts, uh, the highest temperature courses in the throat. So after however many seconds, uh, the brown line is 100 seconds, you've got this temperature profile now uh, in this nozzle and in the throat. Now in your vehicle, you've got a feed line uh, that's feeding this engine and that feed line by necessity has to go back to your cryogenic tank. So you have at least one path and probably through your support structures, multiple paths back to your cryogen tank. So all of the heat that's represented by this temperature grade in the nozzle some of it's going to get radiated away. A lot of it will be in various directions, uh, but some of it is going to come back by conduction uh, to back up that feed line into your cryogen tank. So you've got to take that into account uh, as you look at your mission uh, operations and, and, and understand what's happening to your cryogen. Um, I think this is getting close to the end here. Uh, this could easily be argued it should have been at the front, but I find that people like to see the closed form quick solutions to run numbers first before, you know, seeing the uh, top level big picture. But uh, oftentimes, uh, you, if you can't find a closed form solution, uh, you got to go back to first principles and, and look at the energy and mass balance or conservation of energy and mass. So I've put in some information about this, uh, the kinds of um, uh, building blocks, I guess you could call it, uh, used for different operations to try and put together uh, a numerical solution when, when you have to do it. 
uh, if you're not going to go to a full full blown commercial tool. Uh, so sometimes it makes sense to do that. Sometimes it, you're better off just to use a, a established uh, a modeling tool that's been validated. But uh, this is just an example of some of the variables in, in a common bulkhead tank that you would take into consideration in an energy and mass balance. And uh, oftentimes, you know, where, obviously where you define that control volume makes all the difference in, 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 uh, in solving those, uh, those equations. Uh, a lot of times, haulage and liquid uh, control volumes are separate as well as, of course, fuel and oxidizer tanks. So some more information about that. Um, and then uh, an example of a numerical uh, uh, code that I did for venting when you had a, a when it was subcooled for a portion of the vent and then becomes, uh, and then you get bulk, bulk boiling partway through. So that's what this is showing. And this is with Excel and Visual Basic, but uh, you can see when you hit the, uh, the saturation pressure associated with the subcooled liquid, you start to get bulk boiling and get a big drop in the liquid mass, or I should say a much more rapid drop uh, than if it was fairly steady before that. Uh, I won't go into detail with this since we're getting short on time. In fact, we're, we're ending up, we're wrapping up here, but, uh, Obviously, all of this leads to, uh, in, in, in terms of mission planning, uh, propellant tracking. So uh, how much propellant do you have in, in critical portions of your mission phases um, and calculating those out. So this is an example, a very simple template, template, and it can be used to start to look at the feasible, uh, the feasible options and whether or not you, you're broke somewhere in your mission planning in terms of your CRAG and um, propellant being available in, in the uh, amounts that you need at a particular mission um, segment. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Uh, there's the final calculation examples here and then references appendix, but I see we're at noon. So uh, thanks so much for hanging in there, everybody. And I know I moved very quickly through this, but uh, I'll keep a look at the chat for a little bit longer. And there's an uh, email here actually at the bottom of every page showing to you online. If you send me an email with any thoughts or feedback, uh, uh, I'm open and appreciate any of them, both in terms of the material of the report, as well as uh, this method for um, presenting it uh, versus slides and, and anything else. Uh, so thanks again for your attention and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of TFOS.